Good morning, everybody. Uh, today, on the occasion of World Skin Health Day, I invite you all uh, for joining us uh, for the World Skin Health Day celebrations. Uh, we are hosting from Chennai, and uh, in behalf of Institute, I welcome you all. I would like to invite uh, Professor Jaika Thomas, President of Indian Society of Tele Dermatology, to uh, address the welcome address and inauguration, inaugurate the ceremony. Thank you, Padam. Good morning from Chennai, India. I know it's morning in Chennai, the rest of the world. Greetings of the day. What else can I say when I have a galaxy of speakers with me who have all been very, very kind to accept our invitation. So at the very outset, I welcome all our OC speakers. To mention their names, I welcome Professor Robert Schwartz from Nawak, USA. Professor Bing Thao from the Netherlands, Professor George Prince from Germany, Professor Ioannis Derry from Philippines, Professor Najib Das from Tunisia. The unimaginable for just a pair of us, my good friend, Dr. Padam Kumar, the Honorary Secretary General of the Indian Society of Tele Dermatology and I were able to get five OC speakers. I'm very, very thankful to them, and I wholeheartedly welcome them to this wonderful day. Just a few words, most of you do know about this World Skin Health Day. The International League of Dermatology Societies, of which we are a part, has told us to observe this World Skin Health Day according to our convenience. So this day was fixed about three months ago. We couldn't change the date due to several reasons, although we are facing the grip of the th second wave of the pandemic. Now, apart from the overseas speakers, we got a wonderful couple from the north of India, from Noida, Dr. Rajiv Sekri and his pretty wife, Dr. Vinu Sekri. Now, the two of them, I have known only for the past few months, but although I have known them for the past few months, it appears to me like as if I have known them for ages. So, the Sikris, I welcome you. Thank you very much. And then one more speaker left is our very good and pretty young lady, Dr. Uday Preet Siddhu from Bengaluru. She was previously working as my resident for a brief period, getting trained for pediatric dermatology. And of course, I don't have to welcome people like Dr. Dinesh Kumar, who was the past secretary and brought on the society from the year 2007. That's a long period. Huh? We did work hard and Dinesh, Dr. Dinesh Kumar Devaraj, and then now recently, Dr. Padam Kumar has taken over. I deem it a privilege also, my dear friends, to extend a warm welcome to our digital partners, Messrs. Doc Plexus, particularly Dr. Priyanka Power and Dr. Madhu. And the two of them have been working in unison with us and getting things organized the best possible way. I welcome you all. And then last but not the least, our partners who have been sponsoring, our scientific partners, or academic partners, Messrs. Sibamed, particularly Mr. Prashant, the manager from Sibamed. And I welcome the entire Sibamed team who are here with us. And of course, it's my duty to make sure that I welcome all the participants, all the members of the audience from different parts of the world. Even yesterday, I got a call from one of my colleagues that the Malaysian dermatologists are interested in joining us, and immediately I sent them the link. 
Similarly, a few days earlier from Singapore and the rest of the world, so many I can't keep mentioning all of them. I welcome all of you and I'm sure you're going to have a academic fiesta in dermatology. And with these words, in my capacity as the president of the Indian Society of Teledermatology, I declare this meeting inaugurated and open and pass on to Dr. Padam Kumar. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. You would, like, uh, you would next like to invite our eminent professor for today. Uh, the first speaker, uh, Professor Dr. Robert Schwartz. Uh, he's a third decade professor and head of the Department of Dermatology at Rogers, New Jersey Medical School. He's editor in chief of Dermatological Therapy, member of United States Presidential Advisory Council on HIV AIDS, overseas regional advisor of Royal College of Physicians of Edinburgh, and has served on Rutgers University Board of Trustees. He's chairman of the University Wide Academic Standards, Regulations and Admissions Committee. He's gonna deliver a talk on population health in context of COVID-19. Over to you, sir. This for me to begin. Good. Good morning. Can you all hear me? Yes, sir. We can hear you. Okay, perfect. So I'm Dr. Bob Schwartz, and I'm grateful to be here in beautiful Chennai to speak about population health in the context of COVID-19. I dedicate this talk to the memory of Professor Rajendra Kapila. And I thank the Indian Society of Teledermatology and JT, our president, for inviting me on this World Skin Health Day, June 30, my birthday. So I'm grateful to be celebrating my birthday with you too. As you can see, I'm at Rutgers University, founded in 1766, thanks to King George III, in honor of his wife, Queen Charlotte. I have no conflicts of interest. I am a director of the International Society of Dermatology. I am an editorial um, advisory board member for the American Academy of Dermatology, overseas regional advisor for the Royal College of Physicians of Edinburgh, editor in chief of dermatologic therapy, and also, as mentioned earlier, a member of the United States Presidential Advisory Council on, H on HIV AIDS and chair of the global subcommittee of that entity. And Rutgers is one of nine surviving colonial colleges. Um, we were founded in 1766. As you know, we threw the Brits out in 1776. I don't know what took you guys so long. Okay, so wonderful to be back in Chennai. JT, thank you for having me. I love Chennai. I love a Meliparum, the Shore Temples. Um, and I wish we were in person, but I am grateful, very grateful to be sharing this program with you all. I thank, uh, again, uh, JT. I thank our, our, and the rest of our secretary and vice president. Um, I was honored, I guess this is a few years old, um, but again, I'm grateful to be honored again by the Indian Society of Teledermatology. Uh, and being allowed to give this presentation. So again, thank you all for having me and for allowing me to speak. This is Rutgers, 
again, with a long history, one of nine surviving colonial colleges, and the best of Rutgers in the memory of Rajendra Capella. Raj was born in present day Burma, which as you know, was India, and uh, was educated at the finest institutions in his great nation, ultimately a medical degree from the University of Delhi. He trained in medicine in the kingdom and then came to us in 1966 with extraordinary medical knowledge, really encyclopedic medical knowledge. He was the physician's physician. He had a special interest in treating skin infections and skin diseases. He and I wrote our first paper in 1987. We have some 28 papers listed on PubMed, and we also wrote together in nine book chapters. And we have about five more that are in various stages of preparation or submission. Uh, really, he was the invincible. Uh, Rajendra Kapila, really a life to emulate a model for the oath of Hippocrates. A true, true man that cared for high quality patient care for all. Caring, compassionate, with good humor. A true person for young doctors to model after. And here we are now in the real world. Uh, this is Aldo Moroni and me. This is not Mumbai. This is Rio de Janeiro. And this is a good example to show how we have a very, very rich area here. And this is the favela, the very, very poor impoverished area. When we talk about population health, we want for the, everybody, not just the rich, not just the poor. Very, very, very important. Here we are in the favela. You would not confuse that with the beaches of Rio de Janeiro. This is quite a different lifestyle with a dense population. Population density increases the risk, of course, of infection, pandemics. I've been interested in population health for some time. My mentor at the University of California, Berkeley, was Heinrich Blum. Like me, he graduated from Berkeley. And what, what the way it was in the old days, it was two years in Berkeley and two years in San Francisco to get your MD degree. But now, again, in America, we go four years undergraduate school. I studied political science at the University of California, Berkeley, and then four years for medical school, where I went on a small offshore island you may have heard of called Manhattan. Okay. So Heinrich Blum finished Cal, finished medical school, and then went to another one of the nine surviving colonial colleges. You may have heard of it. And then came back, ran a health department, and he really was the pioneer for comprehensive health planning. He envisioned a healthcare system where there was active consumer and provider participation at the local, regional, and national levels. And you can see here, I actually graduated, <laughs> not just in political science, but also in the 18th day of September, 1970, and a diploma signed by the governor of the great state of California, who went on to be president of the United States, Ronald Reagan. And here we are. This Lyndon Johnson really was a pioneer in this area, okay, which we're revisiting now with the particular vigor, the comprehensive health planning and public health services uh, legislation, he pioneered with the whole idea of a national goal, the highest level of health attainable for every single citizen. Admittedly, the goal is a bit utopian in nature because program resources are, are finite and concrete. And I was in Washington, and again, I'm on a presidential advisory council, so I took some pictures. Uh, I like to take pictures it's from the Washington Monument. Um, again, 1975, legislation, lack of equal access to quality health care at reasonable cost was identified and remains a challenge. Federal funds often 
have less than a desirable effect. They produce inflationary. They inflate healthcare costs often. And that's a real challenge in America and around the world. Another concern is failing to produce an adequate supply or distribution of health resources despite adequate funding. And really the lack of a comprehensive rational approach is noteworthy and particularly noteworthy now, as we'll come to shortly. So the National Health Planning and Resources Development Act of 1975 Again, again, stress, public and private sector are not working jointly for effective uh, delivery. There really is a maldistribution of, of facilities and manpower and increasing and uncontrolled inflation of healthcare costs, particularly hospital costs, which in America are spiraling out of control. I'll never forget how wonderful healthcare I got when I was sick um, in Nasik. Uh, Really, at a, at a really was a private physician's facility that was really absolutely superb, because you need again incentives for alternate levels of healthcare. And again, admittedly, I don't have a a broad understanding of the healthcare systems in India, but I do know you have some flexibility that perhaps we lack in America. Substitution of ambulatory and intermediate care for inpatient hospital care, which is very expensive. It's a point I'm trying to make. And often the public is really not aware, or uninformed of proper health care and methods to effectively utilize the resources that are available. So population health is the backbone of any resilient health care system and should improve public health outcomes, mitigating risk with a value-based model. And we need to identify, as you're hearing more and more now in, in the press, um, dermatographic, uh, dermographic based disparities, high-risk patients, and gaps in, in medical uh, attention and medical uh, care. So again, we've often had a system, and of course, fee-for-service really works, but again, it works not for everything. And we, we have an unsystematic approach often. Uh, pragmatic population health strategies, maximizing uh, analytics and intelligent clinical schemes can shift uh, and opt to optimize outcomes. And this is a real challenge for the future. But the future is now. Patient-centered, maximally efficient, utmost resilient system is optimal for all, promoting healthcare literacy via programmatic initiatives. And, and of course, this needs to be financially sustainable. Very, very important. So here we are. Uh, I was involved in helping with an epidemic in 1980, 1981. Um, a disorder uh, we thought was gay waste disease. We didn't know what it was, but of course it was AIDS. And here we are, Presidential Advisory Council addressing AIDS. Um, and of course, that stressed a lot of systems, but now we have an overbearing, overarching pandemic highlighting the weaknesses in the healthcare system, not only in countries that are perhaps a uh, challenge there, but, but really in all countries around the world. Um, the paradigm of improving outcomes with reducing costs needs to be expressed. Existing programs and entities uh, have to be transformed to meet healthcare patient needs with access. There's a decrease in procedures and inpatient visits, which proves telemedicine really can work when properly used. And of course, case management is important, increasing risk. There's increased risk of, of, out, of adverse outcomes otherwise. We need to emphasize care for seniors and others with complex health problems, with wellness checks and informatics. So again, post-acute care is very, very important. Here as it is in India, um, we were overwhelmed initially at Rutgers New Jersey Medical School. We actually had the army in taking care of our patients. It was so overwhelming in the very beginning. Um, unheard of in America. Finding safe locations for patients to recover afterwards is very important. Utilizing skilled nursing facilities, field facilities, and again, making sure people have proper protection using a medical grade protection. Very, very important. 
So again, remote care options for patients that are not terrifically sick. We need uh, to have those. We need to have room for people that are really sick. And we need to prevent potential COVID exposure to patients while closely monitoring those recovering. So telemedicine, telemedicine is slowly transforming healthcare. The potential to improve access to specialty care is real. It can reduce healthcare costs and improve, improve overall quality. At New York University, on that small offshore island called Manhattan, not far from here, um, telemedicine has been shown to be reliable and accurate. And of course, it's been boosted in terms of uh, how often it's used. But often by, by people, again, not just people with urgent care, but non-urgent visits too. Typically, younger people are more computer savvy, but we need to educate everybody. But this can really be very, very, very important. And it's really transforming healthcare throughout the world. Pandemic, COVID pandemic has driven, this pandemic has rapidly driven the expansion of telemedicine. So there's two forms. There's the store and forward, where you get really high quality images. Then you have the real time, where the images are often not such high quality on an iPhone, for example. Um, and, and, and you, but you can actually talk to the patient. And you can, there's hybrid too, that may be the best. But the models, those are the two models of store and forward and the real time, um, where the vision, the video is often of lower quality than still the photograph, photographs. Um, but they're real. And again, in America alone, about 15% of physician visits are now using, or practices are now using telemedicine. And as the United Kingdom National Health Service has noted here in the Lancet paper, digitally enabled care will go mainstream. It is mainstream now, I think. Because pandemics are here to stay. The first pandemic that comes to mind is the pandemic in Athens in 430 BC, perhaps a little before your time and mine. Uh, probably some of you have read Thucydides in the original Greek. Um, I quoted here in English translation. Thucydides was a great soldier and a great historian. And, and as with the present pandemic, this pandemic, which was not the bubonic plague, challenged democracy in Athens, which was a direct democracy, as it resisted Sparta in the Peloponnesian War. You had this pandemic coming up from Africa, hitting the Mediterranean. People developed high fever, uh, their tongues were bleeding, they were violent coughing, wrenching. You have blisters on the skin, reddish, livid, broken out in small blisters and sores, starting from the head and going down to fingers and toes. Hippocrates came up from Kus, the island where he lived, and couldn't figure it out. So I don't think you and I will be able to do it either. Looks like a hemorrhagic fever, hemorrhagic fever as I look at it, like Ebola. Nobody knows. But this was a terrible, terrible pandemic that really changed things politically because pandemics have implications and even scarier than neurologic ones. Total loss of memory as they recovered, could not identify themselves or those closest to them. <clears throat> Devastating, terrifying, like your computer wiped clean, clean but the computer is your brain. Absolutely devastating. Now let's become a little more current perhaps. <clears throat> In the last century, there were two pandemics that killed more than a million people. The so-called Spanish flu of 1918, 1919, which did not originate in Spain, <clears throat> killed some 40 to 50 million people. And of course, the neurologic complications, they documented it by von Economo, you have post, uh, you have a number of these findings, including um, Parkinsonian changes, when the limbic system was involved, moral facility, which may have produced more. And then, of course, the Asian flu, which did come from China from 1957, 1958, with the neurologic symptoms delineated by General C.C. Capilla, one of the finest, uh, most distinguished physicians of his generation. And killed more than a million people. 
But the wonderful thing here is we got a vaccine. And I'll tell you about that wonderful pioneer in vaccine research in a minute. It's probably saved a lot more lives. And then, of course, other pandemics killed less, but a real the Hong Kong flu, 1968, 69. I was, God, I was hospitalized, probably with that, in Berkeley, when I, University of California, Berkeley, when I was a student. That really knocked me for a loop. And then more recently here, you can see the, the, um, another pandemic, but again, not so devastating. So pandemics and other epidemics occurring worldwide, crossing international boundaries, and usually affecting a large number of people, often with a new pathogen or one with no or limited immunity that produces serious disease and is able to spread efficiently person to person. Again, with Professor Rajendra Kapil and me, we covered this and you can read it. Um, again, this is a perfect profile for a pandemic. Now, increased globalization, increased urbanization, enhanced international travel, a lot of us old folks still around with diabetes and other chronic diseases, a setup for disaster. And again, these were the two pandemics, as I mentioned the last time. Ivan Economo is worth reading. And of course, uh, General Capilla in the British Medical Journal, the classic neurologic and hepatic associations with influenza. I urge you all to take a look at that. Pioneering work, this you can look at maybe. And then of course, Elliman, the classic pioneer in producing vaccines, where he actually got specimens early, got five companies independently to produce the vaccines. And so by the time the kids in America were ready for school, they could be vaccinated. He probably saved a lot of lives. Here, if you're in heaven, this is uh, the Baron Economo. And this is really the incredible man. This man should be known as much as Salk and Savin for, for polio. At the Walter Reed Institute, Maurice Hilleman, a native of uh, South Carolina, I'm sorry, South Dakota, um, really made a difference. Incredible. And of course, here, the Lieutenant General C.C. Capilla, Order of the British Empire, your seventh Director General of Armed Forces Medical Services in India. And again, another pioneer of whom you can be very, very, very proud. So we're on corona coronavirus is another RNA virus. It's a large family that infects many species, rats and bats, camels, beluga whales even. Unlike influenza, they do mutate more slowly, but they do mutate. There are some seven coronaviruses that are infected humans, four produce the common cold, and have been around for hundreds of years or more. And the three emerging ones, which are, again, quite a problem, and we, we delineated this in early 2020, Professor Noah Almatari and myself, we'll talk about that, of course. So the first one was, was SARS, and I remember I, I flew into Beijing in 2003, and they, they zapped my head with their uh, little toy, and I thought it was very foolish, but I think I was the one that was a, a little foolish. In any case, um, my wife and I were playing with camels in Kuwait, and in 2012, and this, of course, is they, this Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome, the second coronavirus outbreak uh, affected camels, but thankfully did not cross from Saudi Arabia into Kuwait. And notice them, that gosh, the high mortality here. Incredible. And there's my wonderful wife, Camilla, playing with her girlfriends here. Um, camels are wonderful, and uh, but you can, again, transmit the coronaviruses. So the timetable I think you're mostly familiar with. Um, I was lecturing in Southeast Asia, actually, in, in late December 2019. I just lectured in Phnom Penh, Cambodia, went up to Angkor Wat, and put a bong and down of my final lecture in Vientiane. And I wanted to fly back through central China because I'm from, I always say, uh, Canton province. I'm from China. That is, I'm from a small peninsula called San Francisco. And when I was a student in Berkeley, the second language was Cantonese. And I've never really been to Guangdong. I've been around China, but never. And I wanted to take China Southern Airline. They gave me a special tour. I had a lot of time. My wife said, no, you will go back through Taipei, uh, Star Alliance Carrier, like Lufthansa, Lot, Ava Air, where you know you'll be safe. And she was right, because I probably I would have been right in that. Oh, my gosh. And when I got back, actually, Professor Capella was taking care of uh, a professor's uh, 
daughter had been in China, had a very bad pneumonia. We didn't know what caused it. No one was checking in those days. But you know the time sequences here, and I won't go into them. We're grateful that we have a wonderful uh, United States Senator in our state of New Jersey, uh, who's head of the Foreign Relations Committee of the Senate University, United, United States Senate. Course, Say again. Okay, so again, the distinct findings with COVID-19. Uh, three distinct patterns, vesicular, vasculopathic, and chilblain like the toes. And with, again, Professor Nawaf al Matari and I described these early in 2020, three and less distinct, dermatitic, maculopapular, and urticarial. And then we talked about reactions. Um, and then of course we have, again, lifestyle changes too. So here are the vesicular ones, a chilblain uh, like so-called COVID fingers. Um, we worry about hypercoagulation, hypercoagulability in COVID, and this has uh, skin implications too with my student, uh, Dr. Singh. And then of course the masks, the masks are a problem. Acne may get worse, rosacea may get worse, irritant contact dermatitis, allergic contact dermatitis. Professor Capella and I with our student identified implications for healthcare workers and for patients with um, chlorinichia, the Goldman Fox syndrome. And then again, uh, and you can see lots of hand washing can produce problems. And, and here we are with the, the green nail. Again, treating and preventing green pseudomonas nails in an era of COVID. And there are pseudomonas, the water bug is a big problem. Potentially. So cutaneous adverse reactions to COVID medicines may produce, for example, vitamin B12 may produce an acne-like eruption also, tetracyclines, photodermatitis, hydroxychloroquine, specific eruption, recently delineated, generalized postular figure of erythema, and much, much less likely, but may need to be distinguished from Stephen Johnson syndrome. Okay, so here, figure it, again, erythema with pustules, very important entity, which is different, it needs to be distinguished uh, from the other entities. I'll talk about our histology. So, okay, so again, we want to distinguish, we have a patient with perhaps COVID on hydroxychloroquine, and the acute uh, generalized exfol exfol eximitous pustulosis is again, 24 hours usually, rapid, 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 this is, one to three weeks, and of course, Stephen Johnson. And, and again, this is not from hydroxychloroquine, usually it's from sulfur or penicillin, with this generalized, rapidly developing within, you know, 24 hours usually. And so two of my papers on that topic. So again, we covered hydroxychloroquine, which used to be fashionable and still is being used in some quarters. We like zithromycin, zithromax, and uh, again, this needs to be full clinical trial. Again, this is our suggestion, which we published early, was early use uh, of Zithromax uh, in adults and children. Again, worthy of consideration, but of course, again, we need that full clinical trial with the help. And that's uh, still pending, actually from the University of California, San Francisco, they have that all pioneered and we're still waiting for an outcome on that. Another interesting approach from a, uh, uh, Dr. Ruschek, Professor Ruschek, and Abdul Hadi in the UAE, again, uh, of approaching prevention with, with by nasal viral acquisition, nasal viral acquisition uh, with topical agents. Okay. That's a very, very important concept, meritorious of, of consideration, of serious consideration. So we have immunosuppressive therapy in an area of COVID-2, which is a huge concern. How do you help people? How do you deal with people that are on systemic steroids? And we have many of our patients in dermatology on systemic steroids, other anti-inflammatory agents. 
chemotherapy and biologics. And Professor Didi Morell of Australia and myself and myself have of course uh, opined on that too, which you can see here. And, and again, co-infections, big, big, big concern. Professor Capilla and I have been very concerned early. This was of course published ahead of print, so it finally came out in July. We are very worried about cutaneous manifestations of a 21st century worldwide fungal epidemic complicating the COVID pandemic, the jointly menace mankind. This you got to know about. You have to know about Candida auris. This is a global epidemic now in progress. This Candida is multi-drug resistant. It produces special equipment to diagnose. It's rapidly spread on the fomites. It's a crypto killer in the ICUs. And we all, you all heard about the black fungus, mucor, but this one is white and it's cryptic. It's very hard to diagnose it. And it's really, really something you have to consider. And recent data has suggested that Professor Capilla and my uh, concerns are, are valid around the world. Okay. Obviously, the seasonal flu could complicate COVID, but uh, with this, for the COVID precautions, this hasn't been a problem. Aspergillosis is thought to, and this is what's getting all the attention mucormycosis, and appropriately so. But also, I urge you, think of Candida auris. Very, very important. So here I am with another University of California Berkeley alumnus, a man that's made telemedicine possible. You all recognize him? Here we are together in Kuwait. And that's Steve Wozniak. Think different, the Waz. So we need to think different to hit, to handle our new challenges with this pandemic, with its mutants, mutations, and variations, and for future pandemics too. So, uh, JT, thank you very much for having me give this lecture. I'm very grateful. Now it's my birthday, even here, June 30th has now come to the uh, New York metropolitan area. And so it's a pleasure. I'm grateful to have been allowed to give this presentation. Uh, Nandra, uh, Shukriya, Donyabad, thank you all. Thank you, sir. Uh, it was a wonderful presentation on the uh, population health uh, in context of COVID-19. Uh, we had covered the entire uh, dermatological manifestations also along with the uh, general health uh, context in COVID-19. I would like to invite Dr. Dinesh Kumar Devdas to take up the questions. Hello. There aren't any questions coming. JT, sir, would you want to add your inputs to it? Well, let me ask, are you any of you seeing Candida Auris? Is anybody looking for Candida Auris? Yes, sir. Most of the patients are recovering uh, from COVID-19 are presenting with uh, Candida Auris as well as Candidial Balanophosphatitis. Uh, it's because of uh, over usage of corticosteroids and uh, people are coming up with such complaints. Okay. I see. Uh, so JT has his hand up. Yes, sir. Professor JT, sir. I have a question, Dinesh. Yes, sir. Please, sir. Professor Schwartz, in one of your articles in the Dermatologic Therapy, I did read about the Goldman Fox. How often do you get to see that, the Goldman Fox? Well, it's not very common. It's a good question, by the way. Uh, green nails, but the terrifying thing is that, that Pseudomonas, even when you're gloved, 
can be transmitted. And so we were again projecting a risk. Okay, we do not see it very commonly, thankfully. But I think it's very important for, for nursing personnel, for all personnel, you know, but not to you know, have their nails painted, for example, uh, that people, we need to be very, very, very careful because pseudomonas, the water bug, can be a, a major threat. It is not proven to be at this point in time, but we're all doing a lot of hand washing. We're getting contact dermatitis on our hands. We're getting, I mean, so I see so many patients now with, with severe, with exacerbated acne, exacerbated rosacea, with contact irritants, allergic, and primary irritant dermatitis from masks. Are you seeing that also? Yes, we do get to see. There's another small little thing that I lost with uh, Dinesh's permission. Yes, sir. The, popular, so-called popular gabarin sign, which they talk about in androgenetic alopecia in most patients with uh, COVID. Is that true or is it just uh, more of anecdotal? What would be your opinion, Professor Schwartz? Uh, it's hard mm -hmm. to know. One of the things we have is everyone is publishing. We're all at home more than ever writing more than ever, um, <laughs> sending in manuscripts more than ever, and we're looking for associations. <clears throat> the question always is, is the association meaningful? Is it real? And, and that is yet to be determined. Uh, I also feel the same. I don't think it's really specific. Uh, just uh, looking at Gabriel's sign, some people have said, okay, you can maybe associate it with the age involved. But then there are even younger people and Patients who do not have androgenetic alopecia. Thank you, Professor Schwartz. That's all for me. Would anyone would like to comment on, I guess, the, the healthcare system, I guess, stress to, uh, do you feel that, that uh, well, we can, if anyone would like to comment, I want to be very careful what I say here. Um, we, we feel, I think we're in a pretty good shape now in New Jersey for a time we had, like I said, at the military here because we, we were overwhelmed. Um, uh, is there a, what is the situation now in, in Tamil Nadu? Because I know India has many, many real areas. What about Tamil Nadu? How is it looking in Tamil Nadu? I must tell you that, uh, honestly, we are doing pretty well in uh, India as such, as well as in uh, Tamil Nadu in particular. The government is doing a good job now that we have a new government. Uh, they're doing, again, the level best and in terms of immunization that is the most important part still we have not covered a large percentage but at least a significant percentage with the vaccines so i think uh, i can tell boldly we are doing well as i told you yesterday i was talking to some of my friends in the far east they said they're doing very poorly uh, in terms of preventing or even managing the disease they get 6,000 plus every day, as we have come down in, to a hundreds now. So I think we are doing pretty well. We're not doing as well as Americans are. <laughs> are, are all your patients are all the Delta variants or, or? Yes. Uh, predominantly. Because we're waiting for that to hit in America in, in large quantities with some concern. Some trepidation, I guess is the phrase. Thank you. So one, one thing what I personally feel is Tamil Nadu in particular has done well because uh, over the progressive successive decades, there has been a very good investment in the basic health infrastructure in Tamil Nadu. And that has, uh, I think, uh, helped Tamil Nadu uh, uh, hold on very good during the current crisis. Would anybody like to comment on other other parts of the great in, nation of India? How's everything in, in um, Kashmir? How's everything in uh, the Punjab? Um, hey, how are things in Punjab? Uh, though I'm not actively there right now, sir. But uh, from what I know, things are definitely looking better. And uh, I think... Uh, 
There's a uh, dulling of cases everywhere. And um, uh, I think the government is trying to be very prepared for the third wave. And uh, they are trying to be very vigilant about it. So um, I, I hope and I seriously pray that, you know, uh, if the third wave comes, um, we are much more prepared and we as medical professionals do uh, what we are supposed to do and continue with um, all the efforts. How about in Gujarat? Any comment from Gujarat? Is Gujarat represented? I think that's the state um, all over India. I think everyone's trying to be prepared and more uh, cautious. And uh, I, I think we'll all get through this. I agree. Dr. Madhu, can you get any questions from the audience and share it with us? If there are any questions from the audience. So we don't have questions as of now. From the other platform. Okay. Okay. okay no, no questions on chat, I guess. Okay. I don't see any chat here. So what are you seeing as the most common cutaneous sign? of COVID in Tamil Nadu? Maclopapular rashes. Very few of vesiculation, but there are a few cases of vesicles. <clears throat> we find it difficult to differentiate them from the varicella vesicle, clinical. And are you, are you using any hydroxychloroquine or that's no longer fashionable? We were using tons of hydroxychloroquine sulfate, tons and tons of them. That's only the hydroxychloroquine sulfate, zinc, and uh, vitamin C. Steroids for acute cases, and some cases, remdesivir, so much of remdesivir that we ran short of remdesivir. You know? And eventually, the WHO told remdesivir is useless. <laughs> Are you seeing any of the generalized um, um, figure it, uh, generalized pustular figure it erythema from no, from no, the, no. Uh, I was very particular looking for that, you know. After I read your article, uh, I was very, very particularly looking for that. I didn't see anything, Professor Schwartz. Surprisingly, I don't know if there's any particular regional uh, variation towards the manifestation, you know. So, but, uh, I, I, um, how common is uh, post-COVID exfoliation of the skin of the palms and soles. I, I've seen a good number of cases having post-COVID exfoliation of the uh, palmar plantar skin. What was that, Dinesh, please? Palmar plantar? Uh, Post-COVID uh, exfoliation or peeling of the skin of the palmar plantar area. It's not too common, I don't think, in my experience. I, I would really say that uh, anything on the palm or plantar area, whether post-COVID or non-COVID, after a point of time is going to exfoliate. We have seen drug reactions, eczemas, fungal infection, psoriasis, secondary syphilis. All of them exfoliate after a point of time. So I don't think we should really, we can really pin it down as post-COVID. So uh, there is a question, <laughs> were there any typical cutaneous lesions observed in different age groups? Were there any typical cutaneous lesions observed in different age groups? Not that I'm aware of. Uh, what about uh, Professor JT? Any experience in that area? No, I don't think we have done enough study to really classify or stratify age-wise, you know. The cutaneous manifestations. Okay, so uh, there's one more question. Uh, in India, there is a lot of people were into hot air inhalation or steam inhalation for uh, the treat prophylactic uh, in anticipation that it may help to uh, avoid COVID. So, does aggressive hot air inhalation invite respiratory fungal infection? Is the question. Uh. Would you please repeat that? I am sorry. Does aggressive hot hair inhalation invite respiratory fungal infection? Yeah, meaning a steam inhalation. Steam inhalation. Or steam inhalation. 
because at some point of time in india people were uh, into steam inhalation because they thought that may prevent uh, uh, the covid infection so does it cause fungal infection is the question well uh, i guess what you i have no people idea people were going bonkers actually yeah. <laughs> people were going bonkers with that steam inhalation and uh, there are still people who are going bonkers with steam inhalation i don't know how much it really helps and whether it will really cause any fungal infection have you read uh, our experience anything dinesh yourself no sir what about uh, padam uday no sir any of you so definitely have seen a lot of people having irritation as such and uh, it goes unexplained and then um, once we tend to take a history we come to know you know they've not only been um, just doing steam inhalation they've been putting a lot of um, you know those green capsules and um, some people have been even putting a little bit of um, turmeric and so on but uh, i'm not uh, uh, i won't be able to comment if uh, that would lead on to any fungal or any other infections but i think as such the respiratory mucosa would tend to get a little bit um, affected because of constant steam so maybe some allergies or something can come up i wonder if the steam is if the fungus there's fungus in and they're contaminated by throwing in fungus in if it's contaminated to begin with which is what you'd worry about i would think um in that setting um the innovative thoughts of professor um brushek in the uae with professor abdul hadi and uh, you know where you can actually affect the the uh, reduce the, the transmission through the, the nasal passages is an interesting concept again i'm not sure how that's going to play out here but that might overlap a little bit with that in terms of protecting that would be a more protective effort here uh, I, i don't know But lots of fat lots of these fads came into play people are scared understandably scared um, there's a question which uh, which would be a lecture by in itself uh, they're asking for what are the possible differential diagnosis for covid 19 associated skin lesions <laughs> well, well, we can break it down. Obviously, vesicular eruptions is it herpetic? Um is it a vesicular drug eruption? I mean, you have again broad areas of, of differential. Um often early you get an urticarial eruption. Non-specific. Again, Professor uh, Nawaf Almatari and I delineated three that are more specific and three that are less specific certainly urticarial eruptions are less specific but they're real and often they'll be the early changes that we'll see um but the differential diagnosis is very wide and, and also confused by the fact that when people think they're going to be sick they start popping medicines and so you might be taking again people taking b12 vitamins and they end up with an acne form eruption Uh, from vitamin B12 okay um um there that's one of the, the realities that we have and that that are understandable yeah and probably also they take up all the vasculitic disorders you know oh yeah that over with uh, so much of respiratory infection the granulomatous vascular disorders which got to be taken up very difficult to enumerate a differential diagnosis yeah we need to remember that covid obviously is a at least the present form is a respiratory phenomenon of primarily and we're looking in the settings to see how we can correlate the two we don't know what the mutations the scary part of course are the mutations um influenza mutates a lot the other rna virus that we think about so uh, to say i have last year's influenza shot doesn't mean i shouldn't get this year's flu shot now the question here is do we need and i think we all agree we need boosters 
I believe in the public domain, it's been said, that both Moderna and Pfizer have created booster shots that we're probably all going to need. Now, I don't think you're using AstraZeneca, is that correct? And you have a company that makes unbelievable numbers of vaccines, vaccinate, have vaccine products. I think Serum, is it Serum? The name of the company is Serum, I believe. Serum Institute. Indian company. Serum Institute of India. Yeah, exactly. That is, has done an extraordinarily impressive job in producing vaccines. Hmm? But, but the question is, of course, will you need a booster on that? Um, like, what is the status of serum? I understand that though they they produce so many, but they're not all entirely distributed uh, uniformly throughout the great Indian subcontinent. You want? Can you give us an update on that? Is that a fair question? Uh, uh, Dr. Robert, uh, watch. There's one more question. Can we just take it up before we wind up the uh, sure. session? Of course. Uh, uh, what has been your experience with pityriasis rosea like rash uh, in association with COVID as a uh, prodrome? Well, it, it happens. Uh, pityriasis rosea like rash appearing uh, before COVID in association with COVID. What has been? Well, I mean. It, it's not, it's, it's seen occasionally. One never is sure, you know, whether it's a, a, you know, a drug rash from something they took, somebody took in preparation. You know, people are using unbelievable <sighs> number of pills. I, mean, I know here when this first came out, we were on, uh, we, uh, we got our uh, hydroxychloroquine and <laughs> our vitamin C. Uh, we were all ready, you know, for, for, uh, this uh, terrible pandemic, which had yet to really uh, hit its peak. So, I mean, nobody really knows. I don't have an answer. It, it happens occasionally, not uniform. Dr. Dinesh, for yes, that, uh, pityriasis rosea like rash, you know, I see it post vaccination, not in many cases, but in a few cases I do see. But there is one question before that, you know, whether. COVID-19, the severity of lesions observed differently, and did the management of treatment protocols change in such cases? The management protocol does change with severity, and then I would certainly recommend that article written by our speaker, Professor Schwartz, yeah, in the dermatology therapy, dermatologic therapy, the nice, very nice article, 2020. All of you should read that and look at the pictures given there, then we really, and even the graphic representation associated with the duration of the disease and severity of the disease. So, so I would request all of us to go through that article. I have gone through it more than once. I'm so glad that I did read that. Sure, sir. Uh, sir, uh, I think uh, we we would we are at the end of this session. It was a wonderful lecture by Dr. Schwartz, and uh, not only lecture but also sharing his uh, thoughts. Uh, over to Dr. Padam now to introduce the next speaker and the next lecture. For that, I would just like to add a uh, very very special thanks to Professor Robert Schwartz for being with us in this part of the day for him. Uh, it's very difficult. Huh? I don't know how many of us would really accept an invitation. But we will whenever Robert, uh, Professor Robert Schwartz calls us. Thank you very much, my good friend Bob, for being with us. Andra, Priya, Don Yubad. Thank you, sir. It was a wonderful, uh, wonderful uh, day with you. Time spending with you. We would like to next invite Dr. Uh, Uday Preet Sindhu for the next lecture. She is the chief dermatologist and laser physician at United Medical Center and Skin Glow, Bangalore. And uh, she holds an international fellowship from Harvard Medical School of Boston, uh, Embris Sankri Fellowship by European Academy of Dermatologists, Pediatric Dermatology Fellowship from Child Trust Hospital. She is also a member of Organizing Committee Mid Dermacon 2020 and nominated for Skin Care Innovation Award at 4th Annual India Leadership Conclave. 
she is a member of iadvl yuva cell 2020 and she has a special interest in acne vulgaris pigmented disorders and teledermatology uh she is going to deliver a lecture on acne treatment update over to you ma thank you so much dr padam for such a wonderful introduction i hope i am uh, clear is my audio good yes ma all right i would just share my screen and we will go into our presentation this panel is just coming in my way I need to just shift the panel all right and i'm there so indeed it's it's really nice um to be here at the outset i would like to thank jaker sir for having me here and um it was indeed a very wonderful lecture by doc by professor robert and um i do wish him a very happy birthday today and um okay so All right. So a very happy World Skin Health Day to everyone. I do not have any conflict of interest for this uh, presentation. For the next half an hour or so, we are going to be talking about understanding the recent pathogenesis of acne, understanding how that moves on. to formulate newer medical advancements have an overview of the treatment modalities that are existing and look at their limitations and have a word about the special populations as well now starting with the introduction acne as we know is a multifactorial disease of the pilos sebaceous unit The prevalence is about 35 to 90 percent in adolescents. It peaks at the age of 14, and then again at the beginning of the third decade. In the 20s, the prevalence is 64 percent, and in the 30s, it's around about 43 percent. It affects adult women more as compared to men, and it has a physical and a psychological morbidity associated and that is definitely one of the reasons that we need to keep looking on when we are treating the younger generation and making sure that we are providing them with enough of psychological counseling as well and that would also be a defining point for the treatment modalities that we are going to choose it definitely has a social impact another important point that we need to convey to our patients before putting them on treatment is that acne treatment can be long term and they should be ready to invest that much of time and energy into it it's a relapsing condition at times and as per the definition by the world health organization it is defined as a chronic disease the sequelae per se is of we have to look at post inflammatory hyperpigmentation acne scars and that itself is important because that's one of the reasons why early initiation of treatment should be undertaken now this slide i've taken from a journal dated in the year 1960 by Hetchett who actually talks about the treatment of acne which was a lot many decades back and i would like to read it he quotes watch a falling star and then instantly while the star is still shooting from the sky to wipe the pimple with a cloth or anything that comes to hand just as the star falls from the sky so the pimple will fall off from your body 
only you must be very careful not to wipe them with your bare hands or the pimple will be transferred to it. I unquote. So this is the kind of treatment that they were referring to so many decades back. And it's quite interesting uh, to just, you know, pause for a moment and think that from a simple form of treatment to just cleansing off or removing the pimple with a cloth to where we have landed. And that's a long, long journey. Another article which talks about the history of acne, a very detailed one, published in the International Journal of Women's Dermatology in the year of 2017. And they do quote that there were usage of botanical and herbal treatments, as has been put by Goodman in his book, Cosmetic Dermatology. At that time, the topical treatments consisted of keratolytics, astringents, antiseptics, emollients. The term acne was first used by Fudge in the year of 1840, and it has persisted to the present date. In the 16th century, Sir Thomas Eliot described the acne being the reason being of the presence of impure blood. And the fathers of modern dermatology, Robert Willen and Thomas Bateman, divided acne into four types, which were based on the kind of lesions that were simplex, punctate, indurate, and rosacea. The first three were treated with local remedies at that point of time, as we just spoke some time back. And rosacea was supposed to be a cutaneous manifestation of diseases related to stomach and liver. Now, acne, as we know, is basically an interplay of four more main factors, which are excess sebum production, colonization of the follicle by the bacteria, hyperkeratinization with follicular plugging, and the release of inflammatory mediators. Now this slide presents in a nutshell about the pathogenesis of acne. The exact sequence of this is not very clear, but the first step in the process is believed to be the formation of a microcomedome, which is a precursor to either a papule, a pustule, or a nodule. Now, something very important to understand is that the acne-prone individuals have a higher amount of lobules per sebaceous gland, and the overall size of the follicles is increased. The current research on the genome-wide associations with severe acne has identified six gene loci, and these are involved in androgen metabolism, inflammation process, and scar formation. There has been found to be a marked increase of the tumor necrosis factor gene in the acne lesions. The CMIC, which is a proto-oncogene with major role in sebaceous gland proliferation and differentiation, has also been outlined. Now, my next couple of slides are from this wonderful and detailed paper, which talks about the relationship of pathogenesis of acne leading on to the newer anti-acne agents. So first, let us look at what is happening, what's happening with the sebocytes. Now, the androgens are the ones which are responsible for proliferation and differentiation of sebocytes. The androgen receptor activations happens in two main ways. One, it's by binding of the androgen to the receptor. And second is the depression of the inhibitory nuclear coagulator, that is the FOXO1 or the forkhead box protein. In addition to this, there is the role of the toll-like receptors, 
and in acne, the toll-like receptor 2 and 4 are the ones which are majorly responsible for their pathogenesis. So the virulent C acnes is activated, it interacts with the toll-like receptors too, and it activates the nuclear factor pathway, which leads on to the formulation of inflammatory compounds. There is also a role of the composition of sebum, which is highly affected and altered in acne. And the important hallmark of sebum in acne patients is the presence of lipoperoxidase, which is mainly due to peroxidation of squalene and redu reduction in the level of vitamin E, which is a major sebum antioxidant. In addition, there is an increase in desaturation of free fatty acids and reduction in linoleic acid, which tends to activate the PPA. Now let's look at the receptors. So there are three receptors which we already know do exist. That is the histamine receptor, which is activated by the histamine the DHT receptor activated by the androgen, the neuromodulator substance P, which are affected by the stress. Now, the other three, which we can see here in a red box, is the leptin R receptor, which is activated by leptin, which plays an important role in weight reduction. There's IGF-1 uh, receptor, which is affected by the sugar, and the PPA by the free fatty acids and the cholesterol. And this is where the role of diet is also highlighted in acne. Now, coming on to the newer medications, which do act on this pathogenesis that we have spoken at the sebocyte level. So we have drugs that act on the androgen-dependent sebum production pathway. The first one being CB0301, which is a synthetic steroidal antiandrogen and acts by inhibiting the interaction of the circulating androgens with their receptor. So that's the first point we had spoken in the pathogenesis. We have the topical ASCJ9 cream, which is a synthetic androgen receptor degradation enhancer. We have the NPN thousand gel, which releases the nitric oxide when applied topically and inhibits the androgen-dependent sebum production pathway. And then we have the epigalactotechin 3-galate, which we know is a major polyphenolic constituent in green tea and a very upcoming um, molecule as far as various roles in uh, pigmentation, is also concerned. It inhibits the 5-alpha reductase 1 activity. It also inhibits cell proliferation and lipid synthesis in the sebocytes. We have the JNJ029570, which is an MCR1 and MCR5 receptor antagonist. We have the Zolutin, which is an oral 5 lox inhibitor and it is shown to reduce the number of inflammatory lesions in moderate acne by down-regulating the interleukin-6 and the leukotriene B4. There's also found to be a role of botulinum toxin, which reduces the sebum production, the pore size, and the oiliness of the skin. And it can be given as a diluted doses like a micro-botox all over the face. In the acetyl coenzyme A carboxylase inhibitors, we have the lupol, which is obtained from the plant extract of solanum melagona. And there is a 5-alpha reductase inhibitor that is the finasteride available as an oral medication for the treatment of severe nodular cystic acne in males. 
Now, this brings us to another very interesting topic that is the acne and diet. And invariably, whenever we see a patient in our clinical setting, we are definitely faced with the question that, doctor, what kind of diet should I be following? So the things to understand here is that there are three major class of food that promote acne. The first one being the refined carbohydrates. Then we have the milk and the dairy products. And we have saturated fats, which do include the trans fats as well. Now, the insulin and the IGF-1 suppress the activity of the FOXO1, and they activate the mTORC1, which, as we saw, is a key regulator for lipogenesis. The mTORC stimulates the expression of this little compound that we can see in yellow. That is the SREB1, which is the sterol response element binding protein and it thereby enhances the proportion of the monosaturated fatty acids and sebum triglycerides and there is the differentiation of the theca 17 leading on to inflammation and comedogenesis now there has been a linking of acne to the western diet towards the right-hand side of the table are the sources which are responsible or have been found to be correlating with increasing the acne. And these are all starchy, whiter compounds such as sugar, there is pasta, there is wheat, uh, bread and milk. Definitely there's the role of whole milk as well as skim milk. The other um, food ingredients are cheese, butter, cream, definitely the fast foods and the French fries, which is something that a lot of youngsters do like. Now let's look at the paleothic diet. Now paleothic diet in simple terms means a diet which is rich in salads and vegetables. So that adds up to the carbohydrates, which has a low glycemic index. Then we have omega-3 fatty acids. The sources are seafoods and can be oils that contain that. Plant products and spices, which are enriched with the natural mTOR inhibitors and FOX01 enhancers, which are green tea, berries, and our very own curcumin. Again, a very interesting um, and a catchy article about the butterfly effect and acne and their role associated with the diet. In this, the author aims to talk about the butterfly concept, which is based on the theory that small changes might have a powerful effect. And this adds up to our counseling when we talk to patients about the role of acne and diet. And this is a small mandala art done by me. It was correlating with the paper, so I thought to put it up. Again, a very detailed talk, a paper about diet and acne, which reviews the evidence from 2009 to 2020, a very recent article in the International Journal of Dermatology 2021. They go through in detail about the evidence that is available. And eventually, they do talk about the role that diet does play a positive role. But then the conclusion is that there is definitely much more research that is needed for us to be sure about the role of each and every um, source that we are talking about. Now, let's look at the second compound, a component that is about the keratinocytes, the role of keratinocytes in acne. So here what happens is that there is an altered sebum production. There's the binding of androgen with the receptors. 
there is the interleukin-1, which leads on to the hyperkeratosis. Again, we've seen that, that the TLR2 and 4 um, combined with the C acnase, and there is an activation of the pathway leading on to the inflammation. And why are the CD36, there is generation of the reactive oxygen species, which leads on to inflammation. Now, the agents that normalize the altered keratinization within the bilosebaceous ducts are the retinoids. They inhibit disturbed differentiation and hyperproliferation of keratinocytes by, and they do suppress the cytokines. The azelic acid, which has a known comedolytic effect, the EGCG, which inhibit hyperkeratosis by decreasing the level of interleukin-1 in the keratinocytes. Now, the retinoic acid metabolism blockers, the recent one is the talarazole, which is available as a gel formulation, 0.035 and 0.7%, and it is found to have less irritation as compared to the other retinoic acid formulations. Now, the interleukin-1 alpha has a role in comedome formation, and the RA18C3, which is a monoclonal antibody specific for the interleukin-1 alpha, has been found to treat moderate to severe acne. It's available as subcutaneous injections of 100 or 200 milligrams given on the day zero, 21 and 42. And a total of three injections has found to be of causing significant improvement. Now let's look at the bacteria. That is, earlier it was named as P. acnes and the current is, it's known as Cutibacterium acnes. Now, important point to note here, which was, you know, a thought which was a couple of years back is that skin with acne does not harbor more bacteria than the normal skin. They're found to be specific strains that are associated with acne. There's 1A, which is responsible for moderate or severe acne. There's 1B, 2, and 3, which is seen in the healthy skin, and opportunistic deep tissue infections. Now, further moving on to understanding about the colonization of uh, by the C acnes is that hypercolonization of C acnes is not the key factor for acne. And we've understood that acne patients do not harbor more C acnes in their follicles as compared to the normal individuals. So what really happens? So the C acnes tends to secrete different metabolites, which lead on to host tissue degradation and inflammation. And they do tend to secrete the EPS, which is the extracellular polymeric substance responsible for the biofilm formation. Now, this biofilm is something which is very concerning. What exactly it is? It is an organized conglomerate of bacteria cells which are attached to a surface and embedded into a self-produced polymeric extracellular matrix of polysaccharide. Now, the concept was introduced by Burkert and Burkert in 2007, um, and he talks about how this biofilm ends up to amplify the virulence of the organism to manifold, and they tend to mechanically obstruct the bilosebaceous unit and activate the inflammatory cascade. And the bacteria are mechanically protected from the effect of antimicrobials, and they remain in a low metabolic state and can transfer antibiotic resistance. Now, this is overall very concerning to us when we are treating our acne patients with uh, topical or oral antibiotics. And it could require many months of treatment 
with little or no success. And we should definitely think about either antibiotic resistance or the biofilm formation when we hit on someone wherein we are not getting enough of improvement in spite of trying to do our best. Now let's look at the agents that are act acting on the colonization of the bacteria. So definitely we have um, compounds that are known to us. What is new? Let's look into it. So we have a new uh, tetracycline class of antibiotic. It's known as sericycline which is used once a day, and it is found to be useful in moderate to severe acne. There is the Zolav and the NAI, which is a semi-synthetic thiopeptide and available um, and is under evaluation as a 3% gel for acne. There are agents in pipeline which are found to be acting on the P. acne's biofilm, that's rifampicin and NAG, which expands to next science acne gel. Now, this is a topical gel containing salicylic acid, which tends to cause biofilm matrix degradation. There are antimicrobial peptides such as MBI226, pyrothrisin, and amongst the antioxidants. There is the topical vitamin C, which for a long term of uh, 12 weeks has found to have treatment, um, better treatment in for acne. Now, coming on to the acne vaccine, is it something that's going to be coming soon? Is it something which is um, would remain a dream? The time only would tell. But on what concept is it based? So this targets the virulence factors of C acnes, including the secretory C amp factor. And the expert opinion tends to say that if it were to start as a public vaccination program at an early age, it would prevent the further occurrence of acne. Sounds interesting, but we have to see how that phases out. And the last is the inflammation process. So there's the role of different inflammatory mediators and the recent ones which work on this pathway is the nitric oxide releasing nanoparticle and this is a potent biological messenger and it has broad spectrum antimicrobial and immunomodulator properties. There is the Eprimilast which is an oral PDE4 inhibitor it elevates the C amp levels and inhibits TNF alpha and interleukin 8. And 20 milligram of the April mast is found to be an effective treatment for moderate to severe acne. There's vitamin D analogs, there's Dapson 5% gel, which is also available in the market to be used uh, at bedtime and uh, applied onto the skin. This is available, the Dapson 5% gel is also available in the Indian market. Now let's look at the assessment of acne. Now there is no particular consensus when it comes to the classification, but we have a few that is being followed widely. One is by the European S3 acne guidelines, which tends to classify acne as comedomal, mild to moderate, uh, severe and severe nodular. Then we have the one which is recommended by the US FDA. In this, we have four grades, zero being clear skin, one with a little bit of um, inflammatory lesions, two, which is of mild severity, should be definitely um, greater than grade one, and three, which is the moderate severity, and four, which is the severe one, um, and now coming on to the testing. Now, in routine, in our clinical setting, we need not test patients for either microbiological or endocrinological testing unless it is required. So whenever we are suggesting we look at a patient and we think of gram-negative folliculitis, that's when we are going to opt for our microbiological testing. 
Endocrinological testing, yes, when there are signs of androgen excess. So if there is um, increase in weight, if there is acanthosis, if there's hirsutism, if there is a family, family history and um, irregular cycles, we want to be going in for the hormonal investigations. I would not be going much into uh, the investigation because the topic pertains more onto treatment. So now let's look at this review article, which talks about the treatment of mild to moderate acne. And the recommendations are from three associations. That's the American Association, the European, and the Italian Association. It talks about different uh, strengths of recommendation, a very nice article in detail. And this I have taken from the JAD which talks about, uh, it, it's a very nice pictorial representation of the various grades of acne and leading on to what kind of formulations should we be going for. And that's what we are going to discuss. And uh, some of my patients here, so um, who I have treat with a multimodality approach, and uh, in center, wherein we see this young lady, she did have melasma with acne, and uh, she was planning a family, so um, did not opt for any oral agents, only topicals and mild in clinic medical graded peels. Here, this young lady with moderate acne, and she wanted a rapid improvement. So I did put her on oral retinoids and certain in-clinic treatments, which she was very keen on doing, especially for her uh, pigmentary marks. And there was a rapid improvement for this. So multimodality treatment approach is our way to go. Now let's look at a few topical therapies which are available and a few guidelines that we need to be following when we are putting the patient on topical treatments. The most important is that the topical antibiotics, such as be it an erythromycin or oclindamycin, should not be used as a monotherapy because of the risk of bacterial resistance. Opting out for benzoyl peroxide or combination of benzoyl peroxide with uh, topical antibiotics or in conjunction with the retinoid are very effective for moderate to severe acne. We do have to discuss with the patient about the untowards effect that can come uh, because of the continuous usage of the products. And if we are putting them on a irritant product, simultaneously the other treatments such as a cleanser, emphasis on moisturizing the skin enough, using a sunscreen, especially when a higher SPF sunscreen, when they are outdoors and even when they are indoors, has to be emphasized. Now, the azelaic acid is a great form of uh, treatment, especially when we are looking at post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation. And Dapson 5% gel is useful for inflammatory acne, especially in the adult females. Recommendations on systemic antibiotics. Uh, doxycycline and minocycline are definitely found to be more effective than tetracycline, but neither is superior to the other. The oral erythromycin or the azithromycin should be limited only when we cannot opt for uh, the doxy or the minocycline, and when we are looking at special populations. The antibiotic usage should be of the shortest possible duration and a re-evaluation at periodic intervals has to be done. The patients need to be monitored, especially to prevent the bacterial resistance. And just as with the topicals, even Monotherapy with the systemic antibiotics is not recommended. Now, coming on to another topic which is of concern, which we did speak briefly about in the biofilms, is the resistance. 
Now, the cause of resistance, as we've spoken, one can be the biofilm formation. The other can be the genetic mutations in the ribosomal RNA. How are we going to deal with this or how are we going to prevent this? Sorry. We have to periodically evaluate the response to the oral antibiotics. And this is very important to talk to our patients, make them understand that they need to visit the clinic once in three to four weeks if they are on oral treatments. Adding a non-antimicrobial with the initiation of the oral antibiotics is important. Try to use benzoyl peroxide when we are between the antibiotics. And it should be emphasized that the patient should apply overall onto the face and not just on the affected areas of the skin. If there has been a failure to treatment or re-initiation of treatment, a detailed history needs to be done, uh, needs to be taken, and the antimicrobials which showed improvement in the first go should be restarted at the first. Increase in compliance has to be emphasized on the patient. There should be a lot of hand-holding going through about the unwanted or uh, adverse effects and counteracting the same should be emphasized. And there should be combination with the non-antibiotic therapies such as the retinoids or the benzoyl peroxide. Now, coming on to the recommendations for isotretinoin. Now, isotretinoin per se is a wonderful compound to be used for acne. And we should be very cautious about the patients that we are going to be choosing. So when we talk about which acne form should we opt for, definitely we will look at isotretinoin if we are dealing with an individual with severe nodular acne. But also, if there is moderate acne, if there is resistance to treatment, if there is physical scarring, if there's psychological stress, all those things need to be evaluated. The age of isotretinoin usage has been found to be above 12 years, below 12 years, pediatric populations. There's not much and enough of studies that is available. The recommended uh, dose is 0.5 milligrams per kg, and it can go up to one milligram per kg. Another interesting article which discusses each and every um, aspect of isotretinoin is um is uh, this dr. one Uday? In... dr Uday, yes Dinesh here. uh can yes. we wrap it up uh, a little earlier in two minutes if possible sure. because we need to have some time for question and answer session definitely definitely yeah. point noted thank you so coming on to the aspect of um isotretinoin associated with depression a prior history of the mental health of an individual should be taken and um aesthetic procedure if, if they are very invasive, should be avoided. But there is no clear-cut uh, recommendation if the minor procedures such as medical graded peels have to be undertaken, but they can be with um, safety precautions. We do have the hormonal agents uh, such as the oral contraceptives, which are recommended in treatment of, of inflammatory acne in women. Uh, they there are emerging therapies such as the blue light therapy, which is uh, also FDA approved. Physical modalities, we have the comedome removals, we have the graded peels. Intralational corticosteroid injections should be undertaken with a lot of caution as they come with a bunch of side effects and should be reserved only and used only when uh, absolutely indicated. There's alternative therapy also available with um, little... Uh, data existing. And uh, coming on to the non-responders, these are the main groups of non-responders. We have to look at non-drug-related causes, drug-related reasons, poor adherence, and adverse reactions. Maintenance, topical retinoid should be continued uh, once the acne is subsided to a good extent. It is a preferred agent. And for pregnant women, we need to be looking only at topicals. Orals should be avoided. The safe topicals are erythromycin, clindamycin. In the pediatric age group, 
again, op for topicals and systemic agents should be considered when absolutely needed. They do reduce the risk of scarring and PIH. And um, isotretinoin, again, as per uh, the JAD article, is um, a very efficacious treatment, but we have to be cautious and use it, but be careful in whom we are choosing. A last word about mask knee. All of us are wearing masks, and it seems we are going to be doing so for um, some more time. Uh, it is a subset of acne mechanica. It results from the dysbiosis of skin microbiota, and it should be taken into consideration to be used gentle skin cleansers. Topical formulations are effective, but to be used only when at bedtime or when a uh, mask is not being used. And uh, that would be it from my side. This is one of my very cherished pictures with Jekyll, sir. It was in the year of 2012 when we had our instant conference. And this is when I was a fellow with sir uh, doing my pediatric dermatology. And uh, this is the vibrant OPD. And um, acne, um, unfortunately, is a bigger problem than injuries. So a lot of positivity and psychological counseling should be instilled into all our patients. So do spend that extra minute or so to talk to the patient about the impact of acne on his or her mental health. And that would be it from my side. So thank you for your patient listening. It is a pleasure to be here. Thank you, Dr. Uday. That was a very comprehensive talk uh, and you made it interesting. Uh, there's a question for you. Any correlation between anti-aging treatment and acne for women in their 30s and 40s? Right. So very interesting uh, question there, especially, you know, um, we have to, uh, now there are these two different things. There's anti-aging and then there is acne treatments. As far as the correlation is concerned, um, we have to consider that when we are giving, we have to keep in mind, especially about the sequelae of acne, which tends to especially come in an adult female acne that is the post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation. So at that time, we can have two-in-one products, especially uh, looking at vitamin C, which is going to be useful. As far as our in-clinic treatments are concerned, we can go in for medical graded peels, uh, safer ones which do have salicylic glycolic, mandelic, which would be effective both for the acne as well as work as an anti-aging compound. And definitely the retinols, which are a great two-in-one product for someone who has these two needs. Right, there's uh, another question. How to combat treatment failures in women 25 years and above? Yes, yeah, something I think we all uh, face very commonly in our practice. Um, I would want to start by saying that there has to be a lot of emphasis given on to compliance. A lot of times, even if we design a very appropriate treatment, it's the compliance which is um, not adhered to. So we have to make sure that the patient is um, in an understanding that this is a long-term treatment. Also, uh, the side effects of any particular ingredient that we are using could be a retinoid, which could cause irritation, could be uh, benzoyl peroxide, which could even lead on to flaking of the skin or initial aggravation of acne should be explained to the patient in the very beginning. As far as the cause of the treatment is concerned, it should be evaluated appropriately. So if we have a hormonal cause, it needs to be emphasized that the lifestyle modification plays a huge role. And it's not um, just a one-way treatment. I always suggest my patient to be equally involved, especially when I'm treating acne, because they need to have ownership of the lifestyle changes that they are going to go forward with. Uh, there's one uh, interesting question. Uh, what would be your treatment of choice for chloracne?
All right. So I think Dinesh, you should help me with this. Uh, so uh, yes, I think uh, cleansers, definitely appropriate cleansers and uh, going forward with um, benzoyl peroxide. Okay. What uh, would chloracne actually is a misnomer. Uh, right. it, it's not really a hyperactivity of the sebaceous gland, what we see. It's more often resulting from a, uh, what do you say, uh, occupational exposure to halogenated compounds, uh, particularly the dioxins. So what happens is basically here, instead of the sebaceous gland being hyperactive, uh, the sebaceous glands concentrate these compounds uh, resulting in cysts. Uh, so they are basically, uh, this condition, uh, they are kind of renamed it into metabolizing acquired dioxin-induced skin hematomas. Uh, the treatment is basically as obvious, uh, you'll have to restrict the exposure. And once you restrict the exposure within two, uh, two years, there is a resolution of the problem. But in the meantime, people can be treated uh, with a conventional treatment like isotretinoin. And a better uh, option in uh, terms of cysts would be to puncture the cysts or to uh, um, do a radiofrequency ablation of them. Wonderful. I think you spoke that quite well in a nutshell. Thank you. Um, no, but that, that was an interesting thing you brought about the diet. Uh, there was a very good paper in 2005, uh, around 2005, which uh, really said food with high glycemic index are uh, very much implicated in acne. And with regards to, uh, in that, they were particularly talking about cow's milk where uh, cow's milk is got more uh, insulin like growth factor one so which is more of comedogenic and interestingly buffalo milk doesn't contain the same so uh, generally uh, as a um, I, I, I kind of advise my patients to stay away from dairy products uh, and I, i've found help in that jd sir your thoughts on that food and acne Yeah, I, I, as a rule, you know, don't tell my patients to avoid any form of diet, but tell them to keep uh, control in terms of quantity, particularly milk. Huh? As you have uh, rightly pointed out, hyperglycemic diet. Huh? When there is hyperglycemia, there's going to be more insulin. More insulin means more insulin-like growth factor. More insulin-like growth factor is obviously going to end up with acne. My interesting point here to Dr. Uda is about the use of clascotyrone. I am personally interested in this molecule, clascotyrone, uh, which is a very specific androgen receptor blocking agent. I have had the fortune, good fortune of uh, using this on a few patients uh, and found it to be very useful. But I've always been trying to looking for an androgen receptor blocking agent. As we know, it's all there. Androgen is the number one cause for that. And even the cutie bacterium, acnes, uh, works only when the androgens are there. So once we're able to block locally, instead of giving an oral anti-androgen, a topical anti-androgen will definitely be very, very useful. When do you use oral steroids, Dr. Uday? Do you use? Oh, uh, so I have... I have not used it in the recent past, but then um, I think as a postgraduate, definitely uh, we've used it for a short period of time in someone who does have a severe nodulocystic acne and uh, is uh, before we put them on other treatment modalities and a short course um, lasting for say about a week to 10 days and uh, gradually tapering it and uh, simultaneously making sure that they are on other uh, topical agents as well. But uh, it's not something that I do uh, frequently, but uh, intralesional uh, corticosteroid injections at times for someone who has an one odd cyst has got some kind of uh, uh, urgent social um, event or uh, obligation. So I do use it for that. Yes, thank you so much. Huh? I was want to add a few things to that. Now, oral steroids are indicated in acne under three circumstances. Number one, as you pointed out, in your cystic acne, nodular cystic acne. 
but more than oral steroids, interleukin seems to have better. Number two, for a brief period when there is a flare-up of acne, following oral isotretinoin, it's worth giving for about three weeks, small dose, short duration. And the third definite indication for oral steroids is when you get acne associated with non-classical adrenal hyperplasia. Uh, that's one thing where you must use uh, oral steroids. So, and that we can detect only by doing 17-hydroxy progesterone levels. So that becomes important for us to realize that. That would be a good piece of information for the residents and even practitioners who are here among the audience. <laughs> Uh, so we have overshot the time and there are no other questions more. There are no other questions, we can move on, Dinesh. Yes, sir. The Dr. Patan. Are here. Yeah. Thank you, ma'am. That was a great talk. Thank you Thank so you. much. Thank you, ma'am. It was a uh, wonderful talk. Uh, we would like to move on to the next session, Interesting Cases in Dermatology by our eminent professor, uh, speakers, Dr. Rajiv Shekhari and Dr. Vinod Shekhari. I would like to invite them on the dais. Dr. Rajiv Shekhari is a consultant dermatologist, Portis Hospital, Noida, is a former research associate at Haines, New Delhi with 29 years of experience. And Dr. Vindu Shekhari is a consultant dermatopathologist at Fortis Hospital, Noida. She holds fellowship in dermatopathology from St. Thomas Hospital, London, University of Grants, Austria, and Boston Medical University, Boston. Over to you, ma'am. Over to you, sir. So, should I start with the first case? Yes, please. Okay. Can you see the slide and? Uh... Yes, sir. Okay, fine. So the, we are going to show you uh, two cases today. Uh, this is the one very interesting for us, of course. A 40 years old female presents with multiple, around 15 of these lesions asymptomatic firm papules. You can see these are the firm papules and these are smooth surface and they are present on the scalp only, no errors on the body. And they have been sitting there for more than one and a half year and there is no lymphadenopathy. So we kept a, a differential of a cylindroma or any other adenaxial tumor. Uh, angiosarcoma, a remote possibility, neurofibroma, a uh, remote possibility, but we kept adenexial tumor as the first uh, priority diagnosis. So this was the lesion which was removed and uh, done for the histopathologic examination. So this is the histology of the lesion that was removed. We can see the epidermis. There's nothing much remarkable to comment upon except that there is mild hyperkeratosis. But what we do appreciate is that it is a lobulated mass. And here and there, the retail ridges are flattened. In the dermis, what we see is two components that stand out. One is the inflammatory infiltrate and the other are the blood vessels. And we can appreciate that the blood vessels are of different sizes. We see smaller blood vessels here, larger blood vessels here with slightly thick, thicker walls as in this one, smaller blood vessels here and larger blood vessels here. So that is what we have. 
And this is the infiltrate, which is uh, predominantly lymphocytic, at least at this magnification. And again, we see these blood vessels, different sizes, branching blood vessels, and so on. Now, there's something very characteristic about these blood vessels. They are lined by endothelial cells, which are very big, eosinophilic, and have copious cytoplasm. The nucleus is oval and vesicular, and the endothelial cells sort of jut into the lumen of the blood vessel. So this is the lumen with RBCs. And some of these uh, lining endothelial cells show these cytoplasmic vacuoles. This is a beautiful picture of a cytoplasmic vacuole. And these vacuoles represent primitive lumina. So another field showing blood vessels and lymphocytic infiltrate and another cell. These cells with pink cytoplasm, binucleate, bilobed nuclei, these are all eosinophils. So we have a cluster here, another small cluster here, eosinophils here, here, and many of them here, here also. So they are scattered within the infiltrate. And another view, a different view showing eosinophils, lymphocytes, and blood vessels. Even this blood vessels with a very round lumen is showing endothelial cells jutting into the lumen. Not all endothelial cells will show those cytoplasmic vacuoles. So putting everything together, we made a diagnosis of angiolymphoid hyperplasia with eosinophilia. This condition has got many other names. It is also known as epithelioid hemangioma, histiocytoid hemangioma, and the other name for this is atypical pyogenic granuloma. Some people also call it inflammatory angiomatous nodule. But the names that have stuck are angiolymphoid hyperplasia with eosinophilia and epithelioid hemangioma. Sometimes these, uh, the histology in some of these cases shows lymphoid follicles. The lymphocytes within the infiltrate arranged as follicles as we see them in lymph nodes. If that were the case, then I would have said, rule out Kimura's disease. Clinical pathologic correlation is desirable. One point that I always like to emphasize while discussing cases is in, dermatolo in dermatopathology, clinical pathologic correlation is very, very important. Otherwise, we can end up giving very funny diagnoses. So, Angiolymphoid hyperplasia with eosinophilia and a very close differential would be histologic differential would be Kimura's disease. Angiolymphoid hyperplasia with eosinophilia is a primary arteriovenous malformation with secondary inflammation. And Kimura's disease is a primary inflammatory process with secondary vascular proliferation. This is an immunologically mediated disease, Kimura's disease. Now, angiolymphoid hyperplasia with eosinophilia, the consensus is not there. It's really lacking on whether this is a neoplastic condition or a reactive process associated with trauma. Dermatologists prefer to think of it as a reactive process associated with trauma or encephalitis and so on. Now, I have been given that it is angiolymphoid hyperplasia with eosinophilia, and now you do the clinical pathology correlation because it can be a Kimura's disease. In the, so I have to look for that. So how do I do that? Now, angiolymphoid hyperplasia with eosinophilia, these are non-tender papules and nodules in the head and neck region. This is very important, head and neck region with no lymphadenopathy. So this is what my patient is. It has, the patient has multiple lesions, about 15, smooth skin color, without any much of the symptoms on the scan. And now, if it is the Kimura's disease, then we expect non-tender, subcutaneous nodules, again in the head and neck region, but there will be lymphedema. And now, second point, 20% of the patients have eosinophilia and IgE levels are normal. 
whereas in Kimura's disease, 100% patients will have eosinophilia and they have increased IgE levels. But there is no comorbidity in angiolymphoid hyperplasia with eosinophilia, whereas 20% patients with Kimura's disease will have uh, renal uh, disease in the background. And this is primarily a reactive process, whereas Kimura's disease is in an autoimmune phenomenon. Now, as I mentioned that it is in a reactive vasoproliferative process and is in an uncommon idiopathic condition seen in the adults and probably triggered by uh, insect bite, trauma or infections and is present as isolated or group acules, blocks or nodules, usually less than 3 cm in size and they are asymptomatic but at times they can be prorated or uh, maybe painful. Head and neck is the most common area and these are benign. This is very important. There has been a, some uh, discussion on this that do they represent the pre malignant condition? But if you see the uh, literature, then by and large, it is consensus is that it is benign, but of course, remain vigilant. Peripheral eosinophilia is seen in about 20% of the patients, but serious complications do not occur. Now, they persist for years and it's difficult to eradicate. Since they are difficult to eradicate, so the patient goes for doctor shopping. They goes from one door to another looking for the uh, cure. And for that, uh, multiple treatments have been tried, like corticosteroids, topical, intralegional, systemic steroids, methotrexate, electrocautery, lasers, and uh, isotretinoin, dapsone, radiotherapy, imiquimod, propranolol, and still nothing is working because it is a vasoproliferative disease. So the answer is surgery. When we say the surgery, then we mean the surgical oxygen has to be done that includes both arterial and venous segments and should be done by an experienced surgeon who can do go to the base of the lesion to remove both the arterial and venous segments to achieve the cure. Thank you very much. Any questions about this so we can answer? Hello, any, any questions? So we'll take up the questions together. Okay, fine. So then I move to the uh, second case. So can you see the second case, sir? Yes, yes. Okay, fine. A 65 years old female who is non-diabetic, non-hypertensive. And then she comes with a disease which is present for the two years. And the fresh lesions are still coming for the two months now. And they are gradually increasing in number. And these are multiple asymptomatic multiple, 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 multiple lesions and these are asymptomatic and all the lesions have raised arrhythmias margin and central clearing. Let us see closely. You can see the raised uh, central, uh, the raised arrhythmias margin and central clearing and this is the fresh lesion and this is something two years old, this is the fresh lesion. So this is on the back, you can see on the lower back the fresh lesions are trying to appear. And this is on the arm. This is on the arm. Again, you can see this is the arrhythmia slightly and margins are raised. You can see even some bleeding is feeling like there is in a raised area, then there is in a raised area. And in between, the area is slightly depressed. But it is again this. This is the raised margin. So I can see that the raised margin, central clearance. So with this, the first thing comes to my mind. I am dealing with granuloma annulare. Okay, that is the most probable diagnosis. Then I ask myself, am I dealing with Hansen's disease or it is something atypical mycosis fungoids? So what we do, we did the biopsy from these two oh, regions. No, this is the uh, old region which is persistent for some time and this is the new region which is trying to erupt. So we have taken the fresh and the old region margins so that we can see the comparison. And this is the histopathology we see. Uh, both biopsies show similar findings. So here what we see is epidermis with flattening of the ridges and there's an infiltrate 
starting from below the epidermis, involving the upper, mid, and deep dermis. And even at this power, what we see is, what really stands out is some large cells. Here also, and here as well. And at higher power, we see that these are giant cells. So many giant cells here, 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 and here. And we also see some perivascular infiltrate. And uh, here and there, we see that the collagen looks a little different. High power view of, uh, I'm going to show high power view from different regions of the biopsy. Perivascular infiltrate, a histiocytic infiltrate with giant cells. So what really stands out is the giant cells within the infiltrate. Here. And here we can appreciate that the collagen doesn't look normal. This is how normal collagen looks. It doesn't look normal in looks and it doesn't look normal in staining. So this is necrobiosis. Another focus showing altered collagen, bits of altered collagen in smaller areas and giant cells giant cells. Look at this. The nuclei are aligned along the periphery like a horseshoe. This is called a Langhans giant cell. This is all along the periphery. This is another feature of Langhans giant cells. Here they are clustered together. Here they are along, <coughs> sorry, part of the periphery. But lots of giant cells. The point is so many giant cells at high power view. So there are histiocytes. This is a histiocytic infiltrate with necrobiosis, with perivascular lymphocytic infiltrate. Another focus showing necrobiosis, histiocytic cells, and more of necrobiosis. So what I'm showing is different areas on the slide which show necrobiosis. So the, the combination of the features, necrobiosis, histocytic cells, and giant cells is very much there. So because this is high part, so we are seeing necrobiosis and a few histocytes only. Lots of histocytes here, a giant cell, another giant cell, lymphocytes, another focus showing histocytic cells, necrobiosis, so this pattern goes on repeating itself. And when I looked at the infiltrate more carefully at high power view, I also found some plasma cells. This is the nucleus, which is eccentric. This is the cytoplasm, which is purplish. And this is what a plasma cell looks like. Eccentric nucleus, more cytoplasm than we see in a lymphocyte. And Sometimes you see the clock face of the nucleus, but it's not very clear in these pictures. Another plasma cell, another plasma cell, another plasma cell. So like that, there were plasma cells within the infiltrate. Giant cells, high power view, and we see two nice large giant cells, histocytes, and necrobiosis. Again, so many giant cells in high power. So basically what I'm doing is you know, showing different areas from the top to the bottom of the dermis just to illustrate the fact that the combination is being repeated. Perivascular infiltrate and lymphocytes here mostly. Now, if we look at the blood vessels, we see that the endothelial cells are normal, maybe a little bit swollen, but there is no vasculitis. Here also, very vascular infiltrate, some swelling of endothelial cells with no vasculitis. And so basically, this was a differential diagnosis between granulomanular mind, necrobiosis plus necrobiosis lipoidica and necrobiotic xanthogranuloma.
So we call it necrobiosis avoidable but atypical variant, and we'll see why. So let us see the salient features of these three conditions, necrobiosis lipoidica, granulomanulari, and necrobiotic example granuloma. Necrobiotic uh, lipoidica <clears throat> occurs mostly on the legs. When we say necrobiosis lipoidica, we're immediately thinking of lesions on the legs, especially shins. Occasionally, face, scalp, and arms may be involved. It has association with diabetes mellitus. The dermal infiltrate is diffuse and full thickness. Dermal mucin is usually not present. Lymphoid aggregates may be seen, but occasionally. It's not a common feature. Cholesterol clefts may be seen, not a common feature. Multiple giant cells. This is what stood out in many, many of the fields. Plasma cells are commonly seen. Now, when we contrast it with granuloma annulare, we see that it is mostly on acral sites, dorsal of hands, dorsal of feet and legs. Other than on acral sites, it's also seen on the trunk or maybe widespread. There are no well-established associations, but there are many associations. The double infiltrate is multifocal. It is not diffuse, it is multifocal. There are areas of necrobiosis surrounded by histocytes, and then there is uh, normal dermis, and then again we see areas showing necrobiotic granulomas. So it is multifocal and scattered. Dermal mucin is focally abundant. Lymphoid aggregates are not seen, neither are cholesterol clefts. Multinucleate giants are seen but are moderate, and plasma cells are rare, if at all. Necrobiotic sample granuloma, the commonest site is, or the most often seen site, is the periorbital area, face, and occasionally elsewhere. This has a very strong association with paraproteinemia. The dermal infiltrate is diffuse, as we see in necrobiosis lipoidica. It is full thickness and it is massive. Dermal mucin is negative. Lymphoid aggregates are seen. Cholesterol clefts are seen. So lymphoid aggregates and cholesterol, cholesterol clefts are a common feature in necrobiotic xanthogranulomas, which we did not see in our case, although the dermal infiltrate was diffuse and full thickness. Multinucleate cells are numerous, we did see them, sometimes with bizarre morphology, we did not see bizarre morphology. Plasma cells are common, we did see them in our case. So, uh, now let us see how necrobiosis lipoidica comes about, pathogenesis. In short, it has an association with diabetes, but Non-diabetics can also have uh, necrobiosis lipoidica. Earlier, we used to call it necrobiosis lipoidica diabeticorum because at that time we felt the association was very strong. But over a period of time, we saw that many non-diabetics also have this condition. So in diabetics, at least, it is thought that diabetic microangiopathy is the culprit. And this results from glycoprotein deposition in blood vessel walls, which results in collagen degeneration with a granulomatous response around destroyed collagen. So we see that uh, abnormal collagen was present in many, many fields. There is thickening of blood vessel walls and there is fat deposition. So, uh, but then what happens in patients? who are non-diabetics. Studies were done to study the microcirculation using Doppler flowmetry and partial pressure, partial oxygen pressure. And what they demonstrated was that these patients have altered microcirculation with low oxygen pressure and high carbon dioxide pressure, which led to ischemia locally. And uh, the researchers believe that because of the ischemia, the collagen started degenerating. 
we don't usually use the term degenerative collagen. We use this specific term, which is called necrobiosis. So they said the necrobiosis in non-diabetics is because of altered microcirculation in these patients. Now, the diagnosis has been given to me necrobiosis lipoidica, <clears throat> which is a common uh, disease seen in conjunction with diabetes, both type 1 and type 2. When I say that, so you look into the data of the necrobiosis lipoidica, you find 35% patients will have association of the diabetes mellitus. If you see the diabetes mellitus patients, it's lipoidica. So this means necrobiosis lipoidica is seen in other diseases as well, like celiac disease, thyroid dysfunction, obesity, hypertension, dyslipidemia, and there are many unknown factors responsible for this. So that is the reason that, that necrobiosis lipoidica diabeticorum is no more used terminology. In our patient, this is what we are seeing. And my diagnosis was clinical, granulomanulare, it has been ruled out, Hansen's disease ruled out, mycosis on whites ruled out, and that too, atypical necrobiosis lipoidica, and that too in non-diabetic patient, because this is what otherwise we expect, the clinical picture of the necrobiosis lipoidica, involving the shins, a yellowish blocks deposited, by and large asymptomatic, but at times due to trauma, they can have these type of uh, clinical expression as well. And when I looked into the literature, then I found the atypical necrobiosis lipoidica. And this is what I look for, that it can present as papular necrobiosis lipoidica as well. This is 2018. And you can see these are the small, small cluster of papules on the legs. And this is the giant publication. And similarly, I look for more, and it is perforating disseminated necrobiosis lipoidica. It is quite spread all over. And then the location wise, it is affecting the face part of the forehead and the scalp, the location wise. And again, periorbital necrobiosis lipoidica, a published in British Journal of Ophthalmology. Uh, thank you very much. So any questions, please? Thank you, sir. Thank you, ma'am. Indeed, it was a uh, good uh, presentation on uh, two different interesting cases. First being Angel. <laughs> The first case being the angel inferred hypoplasia with the eosinophilia, uh, and the other one was a typical presentation of necrobiosis lipoidica uh, in a non diabetic uh, patient. So, uh, I have a question. Uh, so, sir, how did you work up with the first patient? So, like, how, what, how, how did you manage the first? Patient? Yes, the first patient uh, we sent you to the plastic surgeon. Because it is a surgical scenario. The treatment is basically surgery. And that too should include the arterial and venous segment. I have a very good uh, uh, plastic surgeon in my hospital. So I discussed with him and he took up the responsibility. And then he did the nice surgery for this patient. Any recurrence noted thereafter? Not recorded. Not recorded. So far. Okay. So far not recorded. Uh, there's one question from uh, Dr. Grammel Ammol. Uh, yes. Like, he has asked, is there any role of biologics for angel infert hypothesis with the asthmophilia? Yes. Necrobiosis lipoidica, yes. There is a role of uh, biologics. Uh, I showed you this. Uh, as far as the management is concerned, necrobiosis. Uh, lipoidica is in a microangiopathy and is independent of hyperglycemia, right? And what is the etiology then? It has been found that the TNF alpha is found in high concentrations in the sera of these patients, and that's why biologics TNF alpha, like infliximab, adalimumab, they become one of the good choices. 
Cyclosporin, yes, for the initial quick control can be considered, but not in the long run. But biologics, yes, they definitely help these patients. Otherwise, topical corticosteroids have been used in the past and are still being used, and that too uh, under occlusion. And phototherapy has also been considered uh, as one of the treatments. But in this patient, I recommended that uh, please uh, let us go ahead with the uh, biologics, the ENF alpha blockers, and I discussed in detail what is the cause and this business. And uh, I lost the follow up. The patient has not come back to me thereafter. The moment I said that I'm going to use the infliximab, so I'm sure patient must have done Googling and uh, looked into things and have lost it. So in regard to the second case of atypical presentation of uh, necrobiosis lipoidica in a non-diabetic woman, uh, how did you manage Yeah, this is the uh, second case I was telling that uh, a TNF alpha is the uh, primary uh, patho mechanism in the background. So, biologics I recommended. In the first case of injured lymphoid hyperplasia, it was the surgeon who did the job. Necrobiosis lipoidica, since TNF alpha is the thought to be the uh, cesarean in high concentration, so I advised the infliximab uh, to be done in those patients' infusions. And the moment I discussed all this, I lost to the fall in the second patient. The first was done as surgery. Plastic surgery. What are the other various treatment options available by Dr. Mukta Varma? He has asked a question. Uh, treatment for the second for case. For the second, second case. case. Yes. Second case, uh, cyclosporin is one of the choice, but for a short period. And uh, topical corticosteroids under occlusion and photochemotherapy can be considered. Otherwise, even if you don't treat uh, necrobiosis lipoidica, there is uh, not a, a, a big issue. But the thing is, it will persist Ulcer and medical aid is not acceptable to the patient. Ulceration and uh, complications pertaining to it. Yeah, that's why it is now the current treatment is that we should give uh, a dilemum web or a infliximab. Optical uh, intralational steroids. Uh, topical corticosteroids under occlusion. I mean, at night, patient applies the corticosteroids and cover it with the uh, film so that they can be absorbed very well. Role of intralational steroids? Intralational, I will say, is uh, not a great idea because this is what is expected uh, big lesions like that. Yes, of course, anybody has a small lesion, suppose, intralational uh, steroid, there is no harm. But if the patient has such an a big lesion, of course, putting a topical corticosteroid, covering it overnight will uh, give it as good results as the intralinal steroids. But that is one of the choices. Yes, can be considered by a clinician if there is a small lesion. Professor Jetty, sir, would you like to take up? No, I'm fine. I'm fine. <laughs> <coughs> Dinesh, sir, Udema, anybody? I'm especially interested in the first case, angiolymphoid hyperplasia of eosinophilia. Yes. And I have published a few, two, two cases on that. Probably Dr. Rajiv and Dr. Vino would have seen those publications. I published two on two occasions, one on my own and one along with another colleague of mine. Especially interested in that. Yes. At that time, all of that we used to be clumped together. Ah, pseudo pyogenic granuloma. <laughs> okay. Yes. Very long time ago. So, we do have one more case of uh, angiolymphoid hyperplasia affecting this part of the ear. Around the ear. Around the ear. So, we have two cases with us in our collection. Thank you very much, madam. Thank you very much, sir, for being with us. Pleasure. Thank you, sir. Pleasure. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, sir. Uh, it was a wonderful presentation indeed, and uh, we had a good time with you. Uh, since the next speaker arrival uh, will be there at 11.45 uh, p.m., and we are ahead of the time.
uh, we'll take a short break and uh, join back uh, at 11:45 uh, am thank you speaker has not come as yet not joined in no sir not yet joined oh okay.
and all. Uh, uh, we have resumed from a short break. Now we would like to move on to our next uh, speaker, Professor Bak Bing Tio. He is a vice chair from Department of Dermatology and Venereology, Erasmus Medical Center, Rotterdam, Netherlands. Uh, he has been a principal investigator of various clinical studies and translational research on psoriasis and atopic dermatitis. He is holding a post of uh, multiple committee members, uh, particularly Dutch Medical Specialist Registration Committee, Dutch Guidelines Committee for Systemic Therapy in Psoriasis, as well as on Chairman and Dutch Multidisciplinary Guidelines Committee Diagnostics of Small Vessel Vasculitis, as well as in the European uh, Member of European Guidelines Committee Systemic Therapy for Psoriasis, Member of Concilium Dermatological at Venetiological Mortis Society of Dermatology and Venetiology. He's been as a chairman of uh, currently been a chairman of Dutch Multidisciplinary Guidelines Committee for Chronic Writers. And uh, he's a recipient of uh, special awards like the Golden Leaf Dermatology Award in 2010 and Professor Dr. E. Van Bricks 2011 Award in the field of uh, psoriasis patient care. He holds now multiple uh, publications to his credit. He's going to deliver a lecture on microbiota and dermatology. Over to you, sir. Thank you very much, Dr. Madam. So, uh, good morning, everyone. And I hope hey, you have a wonderful day today in India. It's a little bit gray outside here, a little bit uh, raining. And what we are going to do in the next 30 minutes, just to bring you to uh, make you happier with all the microbes you have on the skin, but also in your gastrointestinal tract. Oh, wait a minute. We know as a dermatologist that we are dealing with microbes, like here uh, on your scalp, there is this uh, like seborrheic dermatitis or pityriasis capitis sicca, that's the malassezia, petrosporum, causing inflammation and a lot of itching. And of course, in acne, we know that the corine bacterium. Me, sir. Yes? Sorry for interruption. Uh, so could you please uh, screen share your slides? I, what you mean? I did already uh, screen share, no? no? No, sir, no, sir. Oh, sorry, 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 sorry. And now? Yes. yes sir. Okay. First of all, once again, I'd like to welcome you. And I have to disclose and disclaim myself. As you can see here, I'm related to many biopharmaceutical companies as a dermatologist working in the field of psoriasis. What are we going to do? This microbiota thing, we know huh, as a dermatologist that uh, we are dealing with microbes, like here in uh, Petria scapticica or seborrheic dermatitis of the scalp, that Malassezia or Petrosporum is a microbe that you have to deal with. Otherwise, you can't stop the inflammation. Or in acne, the role of Cutibacterium acnes is very clear. We need to do something about this Cutibacterium acnes to treat acne. So, uh, what are we then uh, talking about? Microbiota is the term we use for all the microbes we have. So, bacteria, viruses, and uh, also fungi, while the microbiome are the genes of these microbes, the total of the genes. That's the use of the terms microbiome and microbiota. But many, many people use microbiome while they are talking about microbiota. So I stick about the microbiota. We are not talking a lot about the genes, but more about the microbes themselves. You can see here that uh, in the last six, seven years, there are a lot of interest to study this microbiota. And the headquarters of microbiota is not on the skin. They have a huge organ skin. 
uh, two square meters, but still the gastrointestinal tract. That's the headquarters of the microbiota. That's uh, the main area where the microbes live. As you can see, there are differences in stomach, the udanum, the small intestines like the uh, unum, ileum, and colon. There are uh, different inhabitants of your microbiota in different areas of the gastrointestinal tract. The most important uh, microbes living in your gastrointestinal tract are located in the ileum and at the beginning of the colon ascendance. Yes, that's nearby the appendix. Those are microbes who are in direct contact with the Peyer's patch. This is this uh, gastrointestinal associated lymphoid tissue, GOLF. This is a lymph node XXL, very large lymph node with almost 60% of your lymphocytes living there in your body. And so this is the most important area if you want to do something about the immune system by using the microbiota. And if we are dealing with microbiota in your gastrointestinal tract, that's almost two kilo of microbes you have in your gastrointestinal tract. And uh, maybe I have to show you once this slide is, you can see here that uh, gastrointestinal tract has two kilo of microbes. We have as a human being, 22,000 genes, but with all the microbes, we have almost 3.3 million genes. And we have a lot of more viruses than bacteria, five to one in our gut microbiota. And here are the impressive numbers of your microbiota. If you want to remember something, the two most important microbiota inhabitants in the gastrointestinal tract are the firmicutes and the bacteroides. Those are the most dominant bacterial species. So once again, virus patch, those are the most important microbes of your microbiota acting on your immune system. The communication microbiota immune system is here. This is the most important location of your microbiota immune system interaction. And the T cells who are involved, the most important T cells are the TH17, also important in psoriasis, of course, but also in inflammatory bowel diseases. And the Tregs, who are the inhibitory uh, T cells, as you can see here by producing like interleukin 10 and TGF beta, it inhibits inflammation. So if you have an inflammatory disease like psoriasis, you like to promote the T-Rex, so you inhibit tendon inflammation. So if you want to do with a fecal transplantation or with eating something good, you need bacteria which stimulates the T-Rex or inhibits the T817. In that way, you inhibit the inflammation. But on the other side, if you want to attack infectious diseases, then of course you need a more, a stronger immune system. Then you need bacteria who stimulates the TH17 and inhibits the T-Rex. And in that way, you get a stronger and a better immune system to attack infectious agents. So until now, I'm uh, talk to you about this uh, these headquarters, this microbiota, the most important microbiota in human body, two kilo of microbes you have in the gastrointestinal tract, whereas the most important location is the ileum uh, circum uh, area, no, ileum, sorry, uh, the ileum area into the colon ascendance, there is the contact of the microbiota and the immune system and the bias patch the lymphocytes who are 
acting as the most prominent players in the, uh, in these communications are the T817 and the T-Rex. Now you're coming to the skin microbiota. Please remember that we have four different skin areas for microbiota. So we have four different kinds of zoos. Uh, as you can say that microbiota is a kind of zoo with a lot of animals in it. Uh, we have the oily area, sebaceous gland rich areas. That's almost in the face here, but also, of course, here, the presternal areas. And the most extensive microbiota is located in the dry area. And here in the elbows, but also in the knees, the moist area, uh, that's, of course, very important in atopic dermatitis. That's the most, the moist areas. And there is a special place for the foot where the fungi are prominent. So please remember for the skin microbiota, there are four different anatomical areas and it's called sebaceous gland bridge areas, moist areas, dry, and the foot. And don't want to make you very confused with this uh, picture, just only showing you that many, many microbes we know from uh, uh, as a dermatologist in the patient care, huh? just like showing you that in the moist area, so in the elbows, molluscum contagiosum virus is one of the members of the microbiota in the moist areas. If you're looking at the foot, and then you see here that also the trichophyton rubrum is a microbe of the microbiota. But if you then, uh, normally speaking, they are there doing nothing, but if they have a kind of an overgrowth, then you have a dermatomycosis, the real inflammatory reaction to the trichophyton. So this is an overgrowth of the virus with an inflammatory reaction. Then you see as a dermatologist, this molluscum contagiosum. Once again, it is normal that every one of us has molluscum contagiosum virus in the moist areas of the skin. This is also an important one. Uh, where do you have the most diversity? That's in the dry microbiota while in the most sebaceous in the face and on the scalp, there you see a lot of uh, uh, less biodiversity and there's a lot of fungi in it, especially the malassezia, the yeast. Let's go now for the acne. We know that Cutibacterium acne is playing a role, a pathogenic role in uh, causing the acne in a sebaceous glands. So Cutibacterium acne is a kind of a bad guy in acne, but you see also the Staphylococcus epidermidis, the red dot. These are microbes who are beneficial. So th these are the good guys. So what you see in uh, acne is that you have more Cutibacterium acne, but less Staphylococcus epidermidis. What you want to have then is, this is a picture of a study in Korea, South Korea, what's happening with skin microbiota in the face if you are uh, prescribing a therapy of doxycycline during six weeks. You see here, this purple one, dark purple, cutibacterium acne, there is a decrease, what we expect, of course, but also you see an increase of the Staphylococcus epidemicus, the good guy. So this kind of reaction you want to have, the good guys going up, the bad guys going down. So once again, the Staphylococcus epidemicus was already uh, uh, published in Science in 2019 by the group of Yasmin Belkate, that the Staphylococcus epidermidis is playing an important role as a good guy. 
as you can see here, this all the blue ones are beneficial effects for the skin health, the health of the skin. But you can also see here that there is a kind of a, a dangerous actions of the Staphylococcus epidermidis. Sometimes they are acting as a bad guy. And this is always fascinates me, what's happening here and what's happening there. But normally speaking, if you want uh, to do something for your skin with a good bacteria and you want to sell a cosmetic ointment, put that Staphylococcus epidermidis because you're not allowed to put live bacteria in your ointment. Uh, so epidermidis is a good guy. But remember, sometimes it promotes inflammation and it also promotes infection. And this mystery has been recently solved in this article of six weeks ago in Nature Microbiology. You can see here that the Staphylococcus epidermidis can express an uh, aureus type wall like tachoic acid. And then in that way to shift the good guy uh, characteristics into a bad guy. And this is what's happening then. And this is why you can see here that there is uh, a bad guy action is due to this process, to this action of Staphylococcus epidermidis. What's happening in the gut, in the uh, gastrointestinal tract, if you're using tetracycline, you can see here that a lot of things are happening and they are acting on the metabolites produced by certain bacteria like the Bacteroides fragilis. You can see that the synthesis of butyrate is induced or stimulated by tetracycline. And in that way, you have also a general immune moderatory effect of the tetracycline. You remember, of course, that uh, like tetracycline, doxycycline, we are using in acne. Uh, what it does is just inhibiting the protein synthesis in the ribosome and the translation process is inhibited by this tetracyclines. Also, macrolides are doing this. Uh, so, I mean, inhibition of the protein synthesis in the ribos um, ribosomes. So, uh, the skin microbiota, important in skin diseases, but please remember that the major immune moderatory effect is in your gastrointestinal tract. And thereafter, you have other less important microbiota areas for us, the skin, but also for the dentist, it's more the oral uh, microbiota or for the ENT specialist, is there this nasopharyngeal microbiota or the gynecologist, we have the vaginal uh, microbiota in your vagina. But of course, today we are dealing more with the skin diseases as a dermatologist. And I see here more the two most prominent inflammatory diseases for the dermatologist, psoriasis and atopic dermatitis that we know that in atopic dermatitis, we have this Staphylococcus aureus causing the exacerbation, causing the inflammation in the skin. And maybe part of the Staphylococcus aureus are, uh, as I told you earlier, the Staphylococcus epidermidis turning into a Staphylococcus aureus-like microbe, and in that way causing infection and inflammation in atopic people. For healthy people, besides Staphylococcus epidermidis, I mean healthy people, there are people with healthy skin, the lactobacillus also very important in the skin for uh, keeping your skin healthy. And in psoriasis, you see that many microbes are involved in here, a lot of Corina bacterium, uh, but this is not solved yet. We have to do more, more research in this area, what's happening in psoriasis skin microbiota. So 
maybe in one or two years, we have more data uh, in this field. So the plug fluorosis is probably related by an overgrowth of some Corina bacterium. And Hester Eppinghuis, one of our PhD students, uh, just here doing her PhD defense on the microbiome and the chronic inflammatory diseases, not only of the skin, but also of your gastrointestinal tract, the relation of inflammatory bowel disease and psoriasis and microbiota. So psoriasis is not only a skin dysbiosis, now that's a new term, but dysbiosis means that it, there is a kind of a disbalance of the microbiota. Normally speaking, you have a kind of a well-balanced uh, population of microbes in your microbiota, but if you see changes, uh, then you get the disease. And you see here, not only the skin, but also the gut and uh, Fecali bacterium, we are not turning in, we will focus on that uh, micro. Fecali bacterium prosnitsi, that's the full name. Fecali bacterium prosnitsi. It's just like the Staphylococcus epidermidis in the skin. This is the good guy in inflammatory diseases. So, what's happening? If you have an inflammatory bowel disease, you have less of these good guys. So, you need to give patients with uh, this inflammatory bowel disease. In our case, this is, could be psoriasis. You need to give them Pecali bacterium prosthesis. In that way, uh, will be the immune system will be then inhibited. The T-Rex going up, the H17 going down. And that's an important one, Pecali bacterium prosthesis. You can modulate your immune system to be anti-inflammatory, so not only in IBD, but also in psoriasis, rheumatoid arthritis, or lupus erythematosus. This is uh, what they are directly doing to your immune cells. This is the human dendritic cells. If you add Fecalibacterium prosnitsi in vitro, together with the human dendritic cells, then you see a going up of the interleukin 10. So that means that we are going to the T-Rex, uh, the inhibitory modulation effect of your immune system. Another good guy in inflammation. So, I mean, this bacterium is an anti-inflammatory bacterium, is the Acromantia municifila. This is a very, very, Sorry, because once again, my Siri is uh, getting lonely again, I think. And uh, the case of the Acromantia municifila, this is a very interesting microbe. This is a very interesting microbe, Acromantia municifila. And uh, you can see here that it inhibits inflammation, but a lot it does also a lot of good things in like in type two diabetes or uh, in the hepatic steatosis. That's why this is a very interesting uh, good guy of your gastrointestinal microbiota world. Of course, we are uh, getting for you more into the lunch. For us, it's more breakfast. Knowing this, uh, about the microbiota in the gut, but also on the skin. Once again, in the skin, you have four different microbiota in the oily part, moist, dry, and the foot. And then you can see that you have good guys and bad guys. The good guy in the skin is the Staphylococcus epidermidis. And bad guys, there are different uh, bad guys, like in the Seborrheic dermatitis, the Malassezia, or the Cutibacterium acnes in acne, or the Staphylococcus aureus in atopic dermatitis. And psoriasis, there's not sure, but Corina bacteria are playing an important role in psoriasis. But what you want is to modulate the disease, your immune disease, by 
diet. Is that possible? This is an, uh, uh, a science special issue on diet and health from three years ago. And yes, we can probably do something by using or prebiotics, probiotics, or postbiotics. What are these? You see here, prebiotics are things we can eat to make the microorganism happy. So you give the best food for the bacteria you need to grow. Just like in the case uh, I showed you earlier, if you want to have more uh, Fecalibacterium prosnitsi or Acromancia municifera in the gut, these are the good guys in uh, uh, inflammation, then you need to give them prebiotics like inulin or more a fiber uh, snack, then you get an overgrowth of your Fecalibacterium prosnitsi, then the immune system will be inhibited. And I showed you also earlier that the Fecalibacterium prosnitsi can interact with the immune cells directly, but also they produce by fermentation, by fermentations of these prebiotics, they produce short chain fatty acids. And short chain fatty acids, SCFA, those are very, very uh, trendy at this moment. Uh, and the most important one is the booty rate. Those called postbiotics. So once again, if you want to do it simply, just like a fecal transplant, you give the bacteria you need in inflammatory disease, that's uh, the Fecalibacterium bacterium prosnitsi or the acromantia. But you can also say, okay, let's eat something which is very nice for these bacteria, so then you have an overgrowth of this good guy's bacteria. Or you said, okay, what do they produce which then can communicate with the immune system? Those are the short chain fatty acids. So if you want to inhibit your immune system in your pious patch, then you need also these short chain fatty acids. So what you have now uh, commercialized is synbiotics. Then you have combination of pre, pro, and postbiotics. Those are the most uh, recent uh, things you can add to your diet. But this is also another important thing to tell you that uh, if you have a very salty diet, if you like salt in your food uh, later on during the lunch, please remember a salty uh, area, if the immune cells encounters a lot of sodium, a lot of salt, then they will get very active. Salty diet means a very active immune system. So if you have psoriasis, please use less salt. That's much better for your psoriasis. And of course, if you like meat or you are more vegetarian, you see differences. You can see it in your microbiota in the gut. And if you prefer more a ketogenic diet, high fat and low carbs, then you see here that you have an increased Archimantia municifila. And Archimantia municifila, that means an anti-inflammatory effect. So like in psoriasis, we always recommend patients to do more a low calorie diet. That means that you can act on the Archimantia municifida and it inhibits the disease activity of your psoriasis. And uh, finally, I just want to tell you that uh, exercise is very important. If you exercise not only slightly indoors, but very vigorously outside by running uh, very, very fast, then you see here that the Fecali bacterium prausnitsi is going up, Lechnospira, but also this Acromantia is also going up. So doing a lot of exercise means that it's not only healthy for your health, but also for your immune disease because the Fecali bacterium and Acromantia are going up. That means anti-inflammatory effect. Uh, then maybe at the end, 
like uh, just only summarizing what I told you in the past 30 minutes is there the main microbiota are located in your gastrointestinal tract, two kilos. By your microbiota, I have much more genes, 3.3 million genes we have now. And, uh, and in that way, you can uh, modulate your immune system by acting in the bias patch microbiota immune cells. TH17 and Tregs are the most important uh, adaptive immune cells for communicating with this microbiota. In the skin, we have four different areas and we have good guys in the skin, Staphylococcus epidermidis, and in the gut, that's Fecalibacterium prosnitsi and Acomantia municipula. And you can try to do something by acting on your diet, by uh, eating or probiotics, prebiotics, or together with the postbiotics is called symbiotics. And not only diet, but also exercise can have an influence on your microbiota, as you can see in my last slide. Thank you very much for your very kind attention. Thank you, sir. It was a wonderful presentation indeed. Uh, I'd like to invite uh, Dr. Dinesh Kumar to take up this session. Okay, so we have two questions so far. Uh, the first question is the uh, role of lactobacillus rhamnosus in atopic dermatitis. Uh, thank you very much for this question. Yeah, yeah. As you can see in uh, in the slide, atopic dermatitis healthy and psoriasis. There is this lactobacillus rhamnosus who are uh, is acting as a uh, health promoter in the skin. So yes, there is some kind of a uh, good effect of this lactobacillus, but we need more trials to show this good effects of this uh, lactobacillus. But yes, there is a certain role, I think, not only in atopic dermatitis, but in many, many more inflammatory skin diseases. This is a uh, skin health promoting effect of the lactobacillus. Uh, we have another this, question. Yeah. Uh, so how long we do, do we need to supplement the fecal bacterium brownness uh, disease? Yeah, and uh, this is probably a very long time because uh, if you are going to travel into Europe, your microbiota, your Indian microbiota, is probably changed a little bit into a European one. Uh, like if you're going to Italy and you eat a lot of pasta, that means high carbs, that will change your microbiota. But after one day, you're going back to in, uh, India, you get your own unique microbiota back. So everyone has a unique microbiota. Uh, so in that way means that if you're going to supply Ficavi Bakim Prasnitsi and you skip one day or two days, going back to a normal microbiota, which is more for the psoriasis, so you have to supply them every day. Yes, uh, Professor Thomas, uh, Jacob Thomas uh, wants to say something. Professor Theo, thank you very much for that wonderful presentation. You're welcome. I am particularly interested in this topic. So just ask a few of my doubts. You are telling about staph epidermidis in acne. Now, I have been telling that for more than two decades. <laughs> yes, and people have not actually accepted it fully. They all are concentrating only on Cutibacterium acnes. Now, there is a new topical antibiotic which has come into India. I do not know whether you have it in the Netherlands or in Europe. Ozonoxacin. Do you think topical application of ozonoxacin might help? Uh, I'm not sure. First of all, I don't have the experience you have 
uh, so I'm not sure whether I, uh, but we need some uh, studies of some data, whether these are very effective or not effective. So I don't have this experience, so I'm not sure. But it, did, did you have the experience? It's yes, uh, yes, we, are just, we just got it about a month back. And okay. using it, we found it to be good. And okay. I am I am putting the whole thing to uh, staff epidemics. The Great. next part of the next part of mine, Professor Theo, is we are talking about the dysbiosis. And when yes. we talk about dysbacteriosis or dysbiosis, in atopic dermatitis, we tend to talk about the leaky gut syndrome. Yes. And in psoriasis, we tend to talk about the irritable bowel syndrome. And you also very nicely put a slide where at two ends, atopic dermatitis and psoriasis was present. I again believe that atopic dermatitis and psoriasis are two spectra of the same disease pattern. Can I have your feedback on that, please? Yes. Uh, do you mind that if I go back to my presentation, uh, then maybe... That this, Professor Thomas, if you can see here, uh, different areas of the world, so the diversity of these diseases. You see that Asian atopic dermatitis, and psoriasis is in the immunopathogenesis almost a lookalike. That's more a TH17 and TH22 stories. Uh, uh, so, yes, maybe it's one inflammatory skin disease, like the inflammatory bowel disease. Uh, you have the colitis ulcerosa and the uh, uh, Crohn's disease. Maybe we are like colitis ulcerosa is more the atopic dermatitis for the gastrointestinal specialist, while the uh, Crohn's disease is more the psoriasis. Maybe we have to think that way. But on the other hand, we have genetic studies that we have these psoriasis genes and we have these atopic dermatitis genes. But some of these immune genes are involved in both diseases. So Yes, I agree. Maybe it's kind of spectrum. Yeah, we believe about genetic factors, but uh, we must also start believing about the epigenetic factors. And unless and until we put genetic and epigenetic factors together, these things become difficult. Now, we have all the while been thinking about atopic dermatitis and psoriasis. But it's time for us to think differently and get into something new. I wouldn't call it new normal, but at least put our brains into it and start thinking and start opening our eyes and ears to what others have got to say also. So thank oh, you very much once again, Professor Dyer. Yes, I fully agree. And uh, once again, I want to, uh, what you said about epigenetic, so I mean uh, histone acetylation or deacetylation, and and uh, of course, it's not faction or age or where you live or what you eat, whether you are a man or a woman, but also very important is that your circadian rhythm can act directly on your immune system. If you like to sleep for eight hours a day, but you only can sleep four hours because you're too busy, and you have to write many manuscripts or other things you have to do, then you have uh, less sleep and your circadian rhythm is then misaligned. And that means that your immune system is going into a TH2 side. So you have a lot more itching and more of your skin disease, especially in atopic people, if you don't sleep well. And this is the effect of your circadian rhythm on the microbiota and directly also on the immune system. But thank you very much for all the questions and all. Very well put, books. very well put, Professor Tyler. Thank you very much again. Thank you very much. Dr. Uday, we have a question. Uh, 
I'm on. Okay, Professor Theo, thank you so much for your um, elaborate talk. It was um, very knowledgeable for us. And I just have a quick question. I would, uh, there are a lot of these products that are available uh, nowadays, even over the counter, which um, do have different kind of probiotics in them. So I would want to have a better understanding as to how effective, in your opinion, are the um, products which contain probiotics for acne. For acne, you mean? Thank you. Yeah? Acne. Yes. 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 Absolutely. Yes. Uh, this is a very... Uh, because in acne, I believe that the most important role is for the sebaceous gland and by the stimulating effects of hormones. Huh? That's why this puberty uh, acts directly on the, in the pathogenesis of, uh, of acne. In the pathogenesis of acne, I believe that this is the main thing is the spacious gland stimulated by hormones. And thereafter, uh, then you can see effects of the microbiota of the skin. But if you have an inflammation, then this inflammation will be also mainly regulated by the gastrointestinal tract. And then you need an anti-inflammatory effect of your gastrointestinal microbiota. So uh, you can then add your Fecalibacterium prosnitsi or a postbiotic butyrate, the short-chain fatty acid, or the Acromantia municifila to your diet. In that way, you act probably uh, uh, much more effectively together with the antibiotics, which has also a monitory effect on these uh, microbiota. So not only in the skin, but also in the gastrointestinal tract. So once again, sebaceous gland hormonal effect, and thereafter the microbiota effects in the skin, but also certainly in the uh, gastrointestinal tract, you can do with the fecali bacterium prosnitsi and acromantia municifila. All right, wonderful. Thank you so much. You're welcome. One last question before we wind up. Uh, what about vitamin D and skin microflora? The role of vitamin D with skin microflora? Yes. Of course, all these vitamins or micronutrients or other things we are not sure whether uh, the microbes are, do they like vitamin D in the diet? Huh? So uh, we are not sure what vitamin D does to these microbes and what they produce as metabolites after vitamin D supplementation. So uh, in general, uh, if you, you know, of course, that vitamin D has an anti-inflammatory effect. So it can be that microbiota, if you're giving people vitamin D, that the good guys in inflammation, so like the fecali bacterium of Acromantia, are then going up. And that short chain fatty acids like butyrate is also going up. In that way, vitamin D promotes an anti-inflammatory effect. But once again, we need more studies, more data in this field. I cannot tell you for sure whether this is the case. We are also having one more question from Dr. Meher Ali. What about the toll of non-pathogenic amoeba in the gut? Uh, toll of non-pathogenic amoeba in the gut. This is, uh, there is a lot of roles for uh, many, many other microbes like amoeba or helminths or other things but this is a very uh, a field which need to be investigated more so i cannot tell you what there is uh, whether the role is important of this amoeba so please excuse me but next time i will certainly do more studies in this area but the amoeba i'm not sure what they are doing in the inflammatory skin disease or in inflammatory disease in general. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much uh, for a wonderful presentation. Uh, we shall now break uh, for the lunch and we'll be joining back at 1 p.m. Indian Standard Time.
to continue our next sessions. Thank you very Thank much, you. everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor. Theo. Thank you very much. For, thank you I for the invitation. Have a good day ahead. We'll meet more Absolutely. frequently. Absolutely. I'm pretty sure about that. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Madam, can we leave and rejoin after about 40 minutes? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, 30 minutes, sir. One o'clock. Oh, 30 minutes. Right, right. Correct. I, I got it. Thank you, sir. So you Thank can you. always talk. You can put the video in mute and audio in mute also, sir. Yes.
and live. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome to uh, the World Skin Health Day celebrations. Uh, we now have three uh, uh, sessions uh, post lunch, uh, and we'd like to start with our first speaker for today. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome to uh, the celebration. Uh, we now Professor have George. Sessions of post lunch. Uh, like to start with our first speaker for today. Our first speaker for today is Professor George Christopher Prince. Uh, he's from Department of Dermatology and Allergology, Ludwig Maximilian University, Munich, Germany. Professor George Prince is full professor of dermatology uh, at the Clinic of Dermatology and Allergology of Ludwig Maximilian University at Munich. He graduated with a medical degree from University of Innsbruck in 1983. One year training in internal medicine at University Clinics at Freiburg. He performed five basics, five years of basic immunological research as postdoctoral fellow at Institute of Immunology of the LMU in Munich. He joined the Clinic for Dermatology and Allergology in 1990, where he founded the research group of immunopathology. He earned as a specialist qualifications in dermatology and immunology in 1995 and allergology in 1996. He was appointed as full professor of dermatology in 2001. His current responsibilities include being deputy chair of department and supervising the phototherapy unit and psoriasis center. At medical school, he received several teaching awards. Yeah, Professor Prince's main research interest is in the analysis of T-cell mediated immunopathogenesis of psoriasis and the identification of target cells and autoantigens of psoriatic and pathogenic psoriatic immune response. He also has been actively involved in preparing evidence-based guidelines for psoriasis treatment. He has published extensively in major peer-reviewed journals. As a main achievement of his research, he demonstrated that psoriasis is based on an autoimmune response against melanocytes which is preferentially mediated by main psoriasis risk gene, HLAC0602, through autoantigen presentation. Today, he is going to deliver a talk on psoriasis pathogenesis, integrating gene, fun gene and function. Over to you, sir. Oh, yeah, Dr. Kumar, uh, thank you very much for this kind introduction. Can you see my screen now, the full screen? Hello? Can so you, you have to share your screen. I try to. Is it now on? Do you see my screen? Yes, I yes, can. Yes, okay, okay, perfect. <clears throat> thank you very much. First of all, thank you very much to Professor Thomas and to Dr. Kuma for integrating me into this faculty and making this link across the continents to India. Dear colleagues, welcome from Munich. What you see is now here our Department of Dermatology. I'm in the back building sitting here at the moment. There is There were some colleagues from India visiting us, for example, Dr. Idrashish Poda, who just sent me an email that he will be listening. So I just say hello to him this way. It looks a little bit like a prison. It was the first multi-floor hospital building in Germany. And therefore it is protected for as a historical building which makes modernization, at least of the building structure, a little bit complicated. Still, it's a great place to see dermatology, to do academic work in terms of teaching and also in terms of research. And I want to address now one particular question that has <clears throat> I've been dealing with for many, many years, trying to understand the pathogenesis of psoriasis. And the advent of technology, of course, has, forward, has created the possibility to forward the knowledge in different fields of pathogenesis research. And I want now to address how we can integrate gene and function into a complex model of psoriasis pathogenesis. I guess that in a way, psoriasis will look quite similar in India as it does in Germany. We have two major types, the chronic plaque psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis with the main risk genes, HLA, CL602 and HLA-B27. But there are also multiple phenotypes like acute gut ache psoriasis, psoriatic erythroderma, generalized pustular psoriasis, localized pustular psoriasis, acrodermatitis, continuous operativa, or in psoriatic arthritis, 
the spinal affection, the peripheral arthritis, and the combined peripheral and spinal type of arthritis. Furthermore, we have learned from large epidemiological analysis that there are a number of diseases associated with psoriasis, such as inflammatory bowel diseases or uveitis, and that the chronic inflammation may create collateral damage in terms of cardiovascular disease, metabolic syndrome, and other disorders, psychological affection, whatever, as many other chronic diseases, chronic inflammatory diseases too as well. Now we may ask if psoriasis is characterized by such a strong keratinocyte hyperproliferation, which we can see here as acanthosis, why do we need immunology for this? And the most obvious or we are convincing argument is that immunosuppressive treatment is the only actual treatment that may transfer the strong inflammatory hyperproliferation back into normal appearing skin. And for me, it was really the breakthrough, in my opinion, when we treated already in 1991 patients with most severe psoriasis, in this case, a generalized pustular psoriasis patient, with antibodies that silence the T cell response. And within 10 days, the patient came back into a normal skin. And this was is also, I guess, the first patient that was ever treated with a biologic in hematology using it to silence psoriasis. And for me, that was the, um, yeah, created the conviction that if we can silence psoriasis inflammation by directly silencing T cells, there must be a very strong immune part in the pathogenesis. <clears throat> However, the, the clue to understand psoriasis pathogenesis actually comes from the inheritance. One of the most beautiful studies I have read about the inheritance comes from Blomholt. He was a resident in the years of 1947 and 1948 on a very remote island uh, in the Faroe Islands in the North Atlantic. And it was nothing to do there as the resident. So he decided he makes use of his time by analyzing the inheritance or the prevalence of skin diseases. And within doing so, he generated uh, pedigrees from psoriasis families, 281 altogether, covering up to six generations. This gives you one an example of these pedigrees. A healthy couple has 12 children, and four of these children develop psoriasis. A healthy son marries into a healthy, skin-healthy family, and half of his children finally develop psoriasis. And Lomhold concluded from the, his analysis that psoriasis definitely depends on inherited factors, but the mode of inheritance could not be demonstrated because it was not following Mendelian rules. However, it reflects that psoriasis has a really complex genetic predisposition. Today, we know about 80 risk-associated common gene variants in psoriasis that had been identified by genome-wide association studies. And in my opinion, the genetic association is really the clue to understand or to get to develop a rationale that explains the pathogenesis of psoriasis. This is a meta-analysis of gene variants that have a certain odds ratio, increased odds ratio for patients, for individuals to develop psoriasis. We don't have to go through gene by gene, but however, in order to understand these many associations, we can say these risk genes or gene laws say so far identified in psoriasis tend to cluster to a small number of immune pathways. And many of these immune pathways and genes are pleiotropic, means they are related also with other diseases and have quite a low risk or odds ratio for the development of the disease. It's ankylosing spondylitis, Crohn's disease, psoriasis, uh, ulcerative colitis and rheumatoid arthritis or systemic lupus erythematosus that seem to share certain gene variants. Now, when we look at those gene variants and risk genes that are associated with psoriasis, then we find that there are actually three major pathways being affected. We have pro-inflammatory pathways in that immune activation type 1 interference signaling and nf kappa b cascade. We have T-cell activation, differentiation and signaling, I23 and I17 axis. And we have antigen processing and presentation. And in order to understand this, we may consider that this group of genes enhances inflammatory responses to trivial 
um, inflammatory triggers, inflammatory responses of the innate immune system. These gene variants are related to T cell activation and the differentiation of a T cell response into a T helper or T cytotoxic 17 phenotype. And then we have these antigen processing and presentation aspects I come to later. This big group makes only 20 to 30% of all risk associated with psoriasis. And we always have to consider that patients are always inevitably heterogeneous for these gene variants. That means not every patient requires all gene variants, but one is associated with SOX1 and the other one is I23 receptor. These gene variants account for a relative small risk and rather modulate disease susceptibility, whether you get early inflammation, whether you get strong inflammation. This is what is inherited in these genes. And individual combinations of gene variants then may promote or produce a particular phenotype or onset. Let us look at a few of these gene variants. For example, CART14 and IL36RN. For these, a direct function has been shown. CART14 mutations are gained in function mutations. They enhance the activation of NF-kappa B and promote a very strong pro-inflammatory response of keratinocytes. And this is associated, for example, with psoriatic erythroderma or with pityriasis pilaris and other psoriasis-like but not identical disease. And then we have gene variants that seem to promote uh, generalized pustular psoriasis through a loss of function mutation in IL36RN, which is an inhibitor of IL36, a member of the IL1 family. And if this member doesn't work properly, a pro-inflammatory signal gets too strong and creates this very inflammatory, highly inflammatory phenotype. Other gene variants, and also just to show how much this is relevant, there are now studies, clinical trials uh, ongoing that block IL-36 and can really silence this highly dramatic disease. We also have gene variants that are related to TNF-alpha signaling, such as TNF-alpha-induced protein-3, TNF-alpha-3 inter interacting protein. And these are two genes that act downstream of TNF-alpha to suppress TNF-alpha activity through downregulating NF-kappa B activity. And mice who are lacking these genes uh, develop quite severe uh, autoimmune diseases similar to humans. And we consider that these genes really reduce the control of TNF-alpha signaling. We have another gene related to TNF-alpha, the TRAF3 interacting protein 2. It links TNF-alpha with IL-17 signaling is essential for IL-17 dependent NF-kappa B activation and for the TH17 and TC17 mediated inflammatory response. And that these genes really play a role in terms of highlighting TNF-alpha function in psoriasis, we can see from the treatment approaches using antibodies or biologics targeting TNF-alpha activity. This meta-analysis from Sawyer et al. has summarized uh, the different response rates to silencing TNF-alpha from infliximab to adalimumab, etanacept, cetulizumab, whatever. And you can see that nearly every patient improves up to 90%, reach a PASI 50 mini, 50% improvement, up to 70, 80% reach a PASI 75, meaning 75% uh, or better improvement. And nearly half of the patients are clear or almost clear into, after having been treated with TNF-alpha antagonists. So TNF-alpha is an essential cytokine and the gene variants related to TNF-alpha seem to increase the inflammatory activity mediated by pro-inflammatory TNF-alpha. Other genes related to psoriasis risk are relate, uh, refer to the jux stud pathway. The stud path, jux stud pathway is a central pathway that mediates intracellular cytokine signaling. And there are two major genes tyrosine kinase 2, which however shows strong associations also with psoriatic arthritis, ankylosing spondylitis, and inflammatory bowel disease. And we have STAT2, uh, um, a gene variant related to a signal transducer and activator of transcription 2. Now, how do we integrate this into psoriasis pathogenesis? We know that cytokines signal through receptors, but the signaling has to be mediated intracellularly, and this is the jux stud pathway, and within the jux stud pathway, TYP2 tyrosine kinase 2 plays an important role in cytokine signaling for IL-1223, 
pro-inflammatory interference, but also other cytokines from lymphocytes, as you see here, and they mediate a signal to uh, change the transcription that finally affects T cell differentiation, the lymphocyte effector function, inflammation, uh, barrier function, many different things that are really related uh, or involved in psoriasis pathogenesis, same as with STAT2 that goes for the pro-inflammatory in response to interferon signaling. And again, we have a number of drugs that highlight that these pathways, that this pathway is really essential. Drug inhibitors blocking intracellular cytokine signaling that have been approved already or are in clinical trials are mentioned here. We don't have to go through, through all of them. However, it's quite interesting that some of them are not only used as systemic drugs, not only in psoriasis, but that they may also be efficacious when we apply them topically to the skin that would make a new type of topic treatment without exposing the, system, the organism to these jug stud inhibitors at all. And then we all have quite obvious gene variants associated with psoriasis that are related to the I23 TH17 pathway related, they refer to the I23 receptor. Again, with the pleiotropic association, we have I12B, I23A, and 12.3 IP2, I mentioned before. And to understand how this works, we can just look at the I23 receptor. There's one, however, rare coding variant of the I23 receptor, which is leading to an unresponsiveness of human T helper cells to I23. It creates fewer memory T cells. It is significantly lower, uses significantly lower secretion of I17 and I22. And this gene variant is associated with a number of different immune mediated diseases, including psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis. So it is protective in the moment it doesn't do the signaling properly. And again, we can take a look at where does it play a role? This is the initial study that really identified IL-23 in the skin of psoriasis patients. However, the study from uh, Lee et al. was just looking at the dendritic cells as highlighted here by the arrow, and somehow did not really consider or even ignored that there was quite a strong staining of the epidermis of the keratinocytes with IL-23 until Piskin showed that actually keratinocytes can express IL-23. And this is an immunohistological staining from my lab showing how strong this IL-23 expression can be in psoriatic skin. Every green spot is an IL-23 positive cell in the epidermis. And it's not only the dendritic cells here in double staining that turn out yellow, IL-23 in green and CD11C in, in red makes yellow. It is the environment also from the keratinocytes that creates this, um, yeah, this in environmental conditioning of T cells to produce IL-17. IL and again, we know from the clinical trials and from the use of these drugs that targeting IL-20 Three, for example, by Justitinumab, Tildakizumab, and Guselkumab, for example, or targeting IL-17 or the IL-17 receptor by Exikizumab, Sekokinumab, or Prodanumab are very efficacious, maybe the most efficacious drugs in psoriasis, where nearly every patient really shows a clinical response, and 30 to 40 percent get clear, completely clear, something we did not consider possible maybe 15 or 20 years ago. Now this highlights which T cells are actually promoting the immune response. It is not the Th1 cells, although these may also be involved in autoimmune diseases. It's not the Th2 cells that have as a functional uh, evolutionary function to fight parasitic infections and that are involved in allergic disease. It is the T helper or T cytotoxic 17 cells. Their actual phylogenetic role and physiologic role would be to protect against extracellular bacterial pathogens and fungi. But if they are being activated under pathogenic conditions, they may promote diseases such as psoriasis, inflammatory bowel disease, ankylosing spondylitis, and systemic lupus erythematosus. And when we look at the gene associations we just heard, then we find that probably innate immune activation, such as by gene variants from TNF alpha, may facilitate activation and differentiation of the Th17 T cell response. 
and then produces chronic inflammatory cytokine-mediated tissue alterations. Of course, when we look at the different diseases that result from this genetic association with the T17 and I23 pathway, we may ask what actually makes the genetic predisposition disease-specific. And this question becomes also obvious when we look how many of these gene variants are being associated really to different diseases, something we call preotropy. This is shown here, for example, systemic lupus, psoriatic arthritis, juvenile idiopathic arthritis, and rheumatoid arthritis. As you can see by the Venn diagram, there are really several gene variants that are being shared by these different genes. Uh, that means the gene loci, many of the gene loci that we see are not necessarily disease specific, but indicate particular pathogenic pathways and also offer therapeutic approaches as we have seen in the uh, use of biologics before. Now, what really makes a genetic association disease specific? I think it's the HLA association. And if we only look at HLA class one alleles, there are more than 19,000 different HLA alleles uh, registered in the IMGT database. However, only three of these, these uh, HLA class 1 alleles predispose to major immune-mediated diseases, and you know B27, mainly ankylosing spondylitis, but also psoriasis, and psoriatic, inflammatory, uh, psoriatic arthritis, uh, inflammatory bowel disease. We know B51 uh, is related to more than spectral or vector disease, and we have HLA CO602, the main risk gene of psoriasis, that is associated with Crohn's disease as well. And each of these genes, I will explain later, has a gene association with ER1. So why do these genes can cause different diseases? They differ in the peptide binding group and they present different peptide repertoires. So 50% of the antigen processing or 50% of psoriasis risk is related to antigen processing and presentation. And here it's mainly HLA CO602. And let us take a look at what HLA class 1 alleles or molecules do. They present peptide antigens to CD8 T cells. And the important aspect that we need to understand is that these peptides are derived from cytoplasmic proteins, meaning proteins that are really expressed within the cell. They are generated by proteotic cleavage through the proteasome. Then they are transported into the endoplasmic reticulum. And here, part of the peptide is being trimmed by an aminopeptidase called ERAP1 to the size that is required uh, for peptide loading on HA class 1 molecules that harbor usually peptides of 9 to 10 amino acids. And these peptides are then presented on the cell surface of those cells that express the proteins and can uh, generate the appropriate peptides to the CD8 T cell repertoire. So an HLA class 1 restricted CD8 T cell response, and this is for me is the most important aspect in understanding HLA association, means that it, the immune response should be directed against a particular target cell. And the most obvious role of HLA CO602 would therefore be mediating an autoimmune response of CD8 T cells against a particular target cell in the skin. And the clue for me was analyze the T cell receptors of the pathogenic T cells in terms of HLA restriction and specificity of T cells. And indeed, T CD8 T cells play an important role. The Kirbner reaction, you know, tape stripping damage of epithelial cells in psoriasis patients can produce psoriasis lesions, and this requires CD8 T cells. If we block in the AGR mouse xenotransplantation model where human skin is being, human sporadic skin is transplanted on immunodeficient mice, if we block the recruitment of T cells into the epidermis and the activation of CD8 T cells in the epidermis, then no psoriasis lesions will develop in these mice. And there's another study that has shown that it is actually the CD8 T cells that produce IL-17, IL-21, and IL-22. Many CD8 T cells look like a minor population compared to the overall T cell infiltrate. However, clonality analysis by either T cell receptor analysis already 1994 uh, shows that there is a very strong antigen-driven clonal expansion within this population, unlike the CD40 cells. And we did this analysis based on single-cell T cell receptor analysis of T cells 
that we had isolated from cytic epidermis. And again, we find that it's the CD8 cells that are clonally expanded, but not the CD40 cells. So, and that was the approach we used to identify or to search for what activates these CD8 T cells. We took the T cell receptors from the CD8 T cells that we had isolated from psoriasis patients that were CO602 positive. We cloned them into T cell receptor hybridomas that at the same time express green fluorescence protein under the control of NFET. And once these T cell receptor hybridomas that carry the specificity of these CD8 T cells see an antigen they turn green, and you can use these T cells to, to search for the appropriate targets, target cells and autoantigens presented by the cells here in the epidermis. And the first surprise was we all expected the immune targets of the immune response are keratinocytes or derived from keratinocytes. But the hybridoma reacted not against keratinocytes, but against melanocytes. Here we see a primary melanocyte isolated from the skin of a, a CW6 positive carrier compared to melanocytes that are CO6 or 2 negative. And the hybridoma gets nicely activated in direct contact, as you can see here in the skin, by CO6 or 2 positive melanocytes. So the T a particular T cell receptor that we were working on now is recognizing CO6 or 2 positive melanocytes. And we could reproduce this response also by analyzing uh, CO6 or 2 positive melanoma cell lines such as WM278. And once we knew what the target could be, we looked at the immunohistology, we did a corresponding stainings. And here you see in green, the CD8 T cells, in red, the melanocytes. And the CD8 T cells in the epidermis of psoriatic lesions are in close contact with the melanocytes. And when you look at activation markers, the polarization of coenzyme B towards the contact sites of the CD8 T cells now in blue here, with melanocytes now in red, then you can see that there's really activation occurring through the immunologic synapse by the polarization of cytokines towards the contact sites. Very nicely to see here how the dendrite is being uh, contacted by CD8 T cells, and this polarizes coenzyme B into the epiderm, into the uh, contact site, same as here. Just to show you a beautiful picture how these CD8 T cells really adapt their shapes to the melanocytes, it is really obvious once you know what to look for, what is going on. So if we know that psoriasis is really an autoimmune response against, or involves an autoimmune response against melanocytes, this would explain why psoriasis is actually a skin-specific disease, why it's really affecting this primarily the skin. And then we wanted to know which is the autoantigen, an autoantigen presented by these melanocytes or generated by these melanocytes and presented by CW6. And we found by really extensive search, lo lots of cloning of antigens and plasmids and analyzing transcriptomes that their peptide from Adams like protein 5 activates our T cell receptor hybridoma and stimulating the blood lymphocytes of psoriasis patients could show that this peptide induces a TH17 response selective or TC17 response selectively in psoriasis patients. You can also see that according to the anchor residues, it nicely fits into the anchor binding roof for of HLA CO602. And this also answers the question why other HLA class one alleles also associated with psoriasis all, most of them, like 701, CO701, or 702, CO704, or B27, have overlapping anchor residues and also can present this peptide. When you look at MH, net MHC peptide predictions, uh, you can nicely show that this peptide is a strong binder also for these HLA it could therefore act as autoantigen and others too. Now I mentioned, and then this will be the last part of my presentation, that the HLAC or 602 is found in gene gene interaction, something we call epistasis, with another gene with ERAB1. Both are involved in antigen presentation. ERAB1 is processing, and HLAC or 6 is presenting the antigen. What is gene, inter gene interaction? It means that two independently inherited gene variants combine to change the phenotype or risk of a disease. And HLA class 1 and ERA1 both cooperate in processing and presentation of antigens. So we looked at what, how this interaction could occur. 
Now, R1 is a polymorphic gene. There are nine frequent coding R1 variants, but they are not inherited at sing as single uh, variants or SNPs, but as common haplotypes. And these common haplotypes then combine different SNPs into a particular protein. And two of these gene variants, one of them in the high risk for psoriasis and ankylosing spondylitis in carriers of HLA602 or B27 in European and Asians, and another one is protective in these patients. These two we took a closer look at, HAP2 and HAP10. So HAP2 increases the risk for psoriasis, HAP10 is protective. In order to find out the function, we now use CRISPR-Cas9 targeted genome editing to generate error one deficient clones from melanoma cell lines that are HLAC or 602 positive, and you see error one is gone. HLAC is still there, and the autoantigen is also still there. However, when we use these cell lines to activate our T cell receptor hybridoma, they failed to activate compared to the wild type melanoma cell lines. These clones could not induce a substantial activation of our T cell ligation of our T cell receptor. And when we summarize this, we can clearly say in the presence of error one, there's a strong stimulation of the psoriatic T cell receptor by CL602 positive melanocytes, while error one deficient cells are not able to stimulate anymore. So meaning error one is essential for the immunogenicity of melanocytes. When we then put in the error one risk haplotype into these error one deficient melanoma cell lines or the protective haplotype, we find that the immunogenicity of these melanoma cell lines increases much or is much stronger than, than what is being mediated by HAP10 in the different uh, melanoma cell clones deficient for ARAB1. And the conclusion is that ARAB1 HAP2, the risk haplotype, is a, mediates a strong activation of the psychotic autoimmune response to melanocytes because it makes them particularly immunogenic. So Patients are at higher risk for psoriasis if they carry CO602, while the HAP10, the protective HAP10, is associated with a weak activation of the immune response and a low risk for psoriasis. What is ERA1 doing? A peptide antigen has to be generated from the full length protein. Here you see the amino acid sequence of the Adams like protein 5, the psoriatic R2 antigen. We know that the C terminus is generated by proteasome cleavage but the N-terminus may be generated by ERA1 in order to fit in the uh, peptide, the antigenic peptide into the HLA-CO6 or 2 binding groove, as was shown here by uh, <coughs> crystallographic uh, structure analysis. It nicely fits into CO6 or 2 if it has a size of nine amino acids. And then we expose the peptide, elongated peptides with a sequence going here into the N-terminus, we expose them to the different ARAB1 haplotypes, HAP2 or HAP10, in in vitro digestion experiments. And you can first of all see ARAB1 can digest the elongated precursors of Adams uh, like protein 5 peptides into the actual peptide antigen. And HAP2 is much, much more efficient to do this than HAP10. It cleaves much faster and generates much more autoantigen within the same time period than the protective haplotype. So what are our conclusions when we look at the molecular basis of autoimmunity in psoriasis? HLA-CO602 and probably also other risk HLA class 1 risk alleles of psoriasis mediate an autoimmune response of CD8 T cells against melanocytes in the skin by autoantigen presentation. It's not the keratinocytes, it's the melanocytes that seem to be the target. This determines the primary localization of psoriatic inflammation to the epidermis and makes it a skin disease. Maybe also uveitis, which has very strong melanocyte content. ARA1 is important to generate the autoantigen for HLA-CO6 or 2 uh, presentation and the corresponding autoimmune response. And different ARA1 variants regulate the autoimmune potential of melanocytes and increase the risk. Putting this all into one concept, and this is my last slide, psoriasis as an HLA class 1 restrictive autoimmune response against melanocytes, of course, requires many different gene variants. Gene variants related to pro-inflammatory pathways, innate immune activation, Taiwan interference signaling, or the nf kappa D cascade, they allow a very strong or increased pro-inflammatory signaling by trivial triggers, 
production with the production of TNF alpha, interferon alpha, LF37, and so on. This promotes the recruitment of an inflammatory infiltrate, including CD8 T cells. If patients then carry the appropriate HLA-C alleles or and the appropriate R1 variants, then the autoantigen is being generated and presented. The CD8 T cells become activated. And if patients have gene variants related to T cell activation, T cell differentiation, signaling, and I23 axis, then they are um, differentiated into a TC17 phenotype under the control of IL-23. This phenotype produces IL-17A, F22, interferon gamma, TNF-alpha. Recruitment of neutrophilic granulocytes and increases the proliferation of keratinocytes, finally promoting this highly inflammatory, hyperproliferative epidermal inflammation. And with this, I just want to say thank you to all my collaborators. Currently in the lab are several researchers. Many of them have left the lab already in transition. Um, uh, good uh, collaboration with the clinical neuroimmunology department at Southampton General Hospital. All of them have facilitated me to forward these projects and to give a certain understanding to what I consider now to be the exotic autoimmune response. It requires that we change our thinking because many say it's just disturbed keratinocyte proliferations. Others say it's just a cytokine disease. But one should ask what is makes the gene association a disease-specific phenotype and who is producing these cytokines. And to me, it is the HLA class 1 restricted autoimmune response that is essential, which is, is in the center of this pathogenesis and essential to generate this phenotype. I want to thank you for your attention and I would be glad to answer questions if you have any. Thank you, sir. It was a lucid uh, presentation indeed. I would like to uh, uh, invite uh, Dr. U R Dana Lakshmi as well as Dr. Uday Uday Bapit Sindhu to take up the questions. Thank you, Dr. Padam. It was indeed a very detailed and an insightful talk, bringing out your ideologies behind the pathogenesis of the psoriasis. So um, let me start first by asking a question myself. Uh, so how would you do genetic counseling for a couple uh, amongst whom either one or both the parents are affected with psoriasis? What would be your salient points or your advice to them Thank you for this question. It's something that is related to uh, the risk of developing psoriasis in offsprings and also the fear of patients who are afraid that their children might suffer from psoriasis as well. And it also has many ethic aspects. There is no single risk gene and psoriasis is not an inherited disease. It requires a number of triggering events that finally provoke the disease in certain offsprings. And I, when we look at the studies, it's 7 to 10 percent of children from, from parents where one is being affected by psoriasis and about 30 percent of offsprings if both patients are affected by psoriasis. And you have seen it from the genetic Lomholz study, uh, the pedigrees. It is not predictable. For me, for me, it is important that one might try to avoid triggering events such as streptococcal infection treated quite intensely early, but I would not advise to do genetic counseling in the way that parents should somehow, should somehow change her, their family planning. Nobody can predict who is getting psoriasis if the children will be carriers. Um, and looking at the treatment options that will further improve in the near future, I would say it's a treatable disease. We could say ask the same question arthritis in myocardial infarction and cardiovascular disease. All these cases are genetically inherited but don't have a major risk genes. It is different from diseases such as breast cancer where you have certain uh, risk genes that really promote the risk of uh, cancer directly. But since we don't have this and psoriasis is such a complex disease, I would not advise genetic counseling today. 
Maybe it will change in the future. Thank you so much. Um, I think that's really helpful for all of us. And um, I would uh, take a couple of questions from the audience as well for um, Professor Prince. And uh, we have a question, sir, which says that, uh, what are your thoughts or can you elaborate on the recent advances in management in pediatric cases? Thank you also for this question. Pediatric cases are also a challenge for us because there are not too many drugs approved uh, that we know that can control psoriasis nicely without affecting maybe the immunologic development in children. Methotrexate, I'm a bit reluctant, even though it may work nicely in children, I'm reluctant to take it because I feel that inhibiting certain processes and that are related to the growing um, organism and the immune response might cause some kind of impairment. Maybe 10, 20, 30 years later, we cannot tell. Children have to mount their immune responses against many different types of viruses and bacteria. All of them go through streptococcal infection. We have to do vaccination. If vaccination is not possible, children have to mount an immune response against varicella or measles or whatever, shingles. Um, so also impairing the immune response may have some problem. I like to start, if it's children and also females, not in birth giving age, to use low dose acetretine, which is often quite nice, control, nicely controlling. We like to use phototherapy still if it's gut ape psoriasis. And if these measures are not sufficient and the patients suffer from severe psoriasis, we use biologics that are pre approved for the appropriate age of these children. But it's still a challenge because we are always a bit afraid to impair the natural development of the immune response or of the organism itself by our treatment approaches. Even though children have a very good um, ability to regenerate from ever whatever we cause might cause as damage. Great, that was a detailed answer. We also have with us Professor JT Sir and Dr. Joannes Daytre. So, um, so would you like to add in something, anything? Um, uh, we do have a couple of other um, audience questions as well. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Professor Prince. My concern in this function of the deans in psoriasis. I would love to know from you and your, observ your, your observations have been out of the world. Uh, we can't imagine doing such a research, at least in, in our country. So having done that, have you at any point of time noticed that there is an overlap between psoriasis and atopic dermatitis? Well, we see in some instances that patients suffer from both psoriasis and atopic dermatitis. And we find paradoxic reactions to biologics when we block TNF-alpha or also the IL-12, 23 pathway or IL-17, that patients improve in their psoriasis and then develop atopic eczema. The other way around, if we block atopic eczema by blocking IL-4 and IL-13, patients suddenly go into uh, psoriasis. And it's quite a difficult challenge. It's quite a challenge how to treat these patients then. And my solution currently is that we use a jug stat inhibitor in case the disease gets really bad, either psoriasis or atopic eczema resulting from the neutral treatment. Uh, however, it's different gene variants associated. For me, some patients may have strong genes related to both of these diseases and therefore develop atopic eczema and psoriasis. But it's quite interesting to see that blocking the TH17, TC17 response then allows the TH2 response to come up and the other way around. This is based on the principle that immune responses suppress each other. If you have a strong TH1 response, for example, by tuberculosis, the likelihood of getting uh, atopic eczema or allergic rhinitis type 1 uh, immune responses, and not type 1, uh, yeah, TH1, TH2 mediated immune responses is quite low. So TH1 suppresses TH2, and the same seems to appear 
for TH17 and TH2, they are mutually exclusive. So it's very rarely observed, but sometimes still occurs. I'm personally crazily interested. I use the word crazily because some people think I'm crazy when I say atopic dermatitis and psoriasis are two spectra of a particular disease phenomenon. I'm glad that I, even the earlier speaker, Professor Thayer, agreed with that. I'm glad that you also are able to give us some useful input on that. Thank you very much, Professor. I think we have to be crazy about these things uh, because otherwise we wouldn't be able to put all this we'll energy get, we'll in working on it. Yeah. So let's stay to stay be crazy and be crazy further on. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. So I would uh, like to thank um, uh, from uh, JT Sir side and from the Indian Society of Teledermatology, I would like to thank uh, Professor Prince for being here with us today and giving us such a detailed talk. So thank you so much. And um, I will hand over to Dr. Padam. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you, sir. Bye-bye, Professor Prince. Bye. So we move to our next lecture. I would like to invite uh, uh, Dr. Giannis Klaus Direct. He's an associate professor and consultant in dermatology at De La Salle Medical and Health Sciences Institute, clinical director of dermatology, aesthetics and laser center, and consultant dermatologist and head of dermatopathology unit at the Research Institute for Tropical Medicine, Manila. He is a fellow of Philippine Dermatological Society and Dermatopathology Society of Philippines. Dr. Direct has lectured on lasers, dermatopathology of skin disorders, of pigmentation and dermoscopy in many countries. He has written book chapters on skin cancers, dermoscopy, histopathology, asthma, and vitiligo, and pigmentary disorders. He is presently a member of Committee on Climate Change and Committee on Constitution and Bylaws of International Society of Dermatology, European Academy of Dermatology and Mineralogy, Skin Study Group of University of Philippines, National Institute of Health, Philippine Academy of Dermatological Surgery Foundation, International Society of Dermoscopy, International Triposcopy Society. Recently, he has been appointed as a council member of Asian Society for Pigment Cell Research. He is currently the editor in chief of Journal of Philippine Dermatological Society. He is going to uh, lecture on, uh, on Rosaceae, updates on skin care and treatment. Over to you, sir. Uh, Let me share my slide. So, uh, good afternoon, colleagues. First of all, I would like to thank again uh, Professor Jaya Per Thomas um, for this opportunity to talk about a topic which I am currently very much involved with. So, the title of my talk is Rosacea Updates on Skincare and uh, Management. And I would also like to thank the officers and members of the Indian Society of um, Electronic so I come from the Philippines, which is one of the famous tourist destinations in Southeast Asia. And I hope that when COVID-19 is already under control, you'll be able to visit my uh, beautiful country. Professor Thomas um, has visited the country a few times already. Our country is very rich in mostly flora, as well as rare fauna and culture and tradition, because we have been under Spanish colonial rule for almost 300 years. And we have a very good mix of um, indigenous uh, people in our population. So I'm affiliated with a university hospital in which I am an um, active uh, professor and at the Research Institute for Tropical Medicine, which is, which is the National Referral Center for Leprosy and Infectious Diseases in my country. So this will be the outline of the lecture. First, we'll talk about uh, rosacea in brown skin, so we'll talk about rosacea among Asians as well as Indians, and cascading the updated classification um, from 2018. And we'll discuss briefly the most commonly used uh, topical and systemic medications for rosacea, and touch briefly on what's recommended for um, skin care. 
So it has been revealed that 47% of Rosacea sufferers hadn't heard of the condition before diagnosis. I hope you agree with me. And 95% knew almost nothing about the warning signs. And in recent years, the AAD has been actively uh, promoting in social media the knowledge that acne is definitely different from Rosacea. The signs and symptoms may be a little bit different and the prognosis um, as well. And more recently, they have been um, posting updates on uh, Rosacea, both in Twitter as well as in uh, Instagram. And this is just one example of Rosacea in a Filipino and this 32-year-old female has been previously diagnosed with acne vulgaris, sometimes already because it's under treatment on and off. But you will see the size of the nose after a one-month treatment with um, iso low-dose isocretinoin. So there's rhinophyma in this uh, patient. There's also a slight enlargement of the chin, which is called uh, natophyma. And if you use um, more sophisticated imaging, we are able to detect redness. So a more uh, intense centrofacial redness in untreated rosacea and a lesser centrofacial redness, lesser degree of centrofacial redness in treated rosacea. Uh, but then the centrofacial redness is uh, persistent. And we are all aware of the National Rosacea Society 2002 diagnostic criteria in which um, there are primary features such as flushing or transient erythema, fixed or non-transient erythema, the appearance of papules and pustules, as well as the uh, presence of phalangic patients. And the secondary features may include any of the following, burning or stinging, plaque type, um, red plaques on the face, dry appearance, edema, ocular manifestations, extra, extra um, facial sites for rosacea, or redness on peripheral locations, as well as uh, climate changes. And in the past, when we see patients which we suspect as uh, having rosacea, we tend to classify them into the major subtypes based on the NRS 2000 classification. So there's erythematophilangiotic rosacea, papulopustular rosacea, phimatous rosacea, where we already detect prominent enlargement of the nose, for example, and subtype four is uh, ocular uh, rosacea. However, um, in fairly recent years, the members of the National Rosacea Society has been and actively discussing um, and brainstorming about the um, diagnostic features, the clinical diagnostic features of rosacea. And they recognized a certain amount of overlap of rosacea features presenting in an individual. And this was cascaded during the rosacea session at the World Congress of Dermatology in July in, uh, 2019. And according to one of the experts in rosacea, Dr. Jerry Tan, who's also an expert on acne, there has been an existing dilemma in the diagnosis of rosacea based on the 2000 NRS criteria, such that as dermatologists, we need to understand a predictive value of each of the diagnostic features, and research is definitely lacking uh, in this uh, field of study. The subtype classification has been wrongly used in the past, and we tend to force patients into categories. And most of us are guilty of uh, what is called conflation, where we push everything together, I mean, all the symptoms together in one patient, which makes classification more complicated instead of making it simpler. We also don't have any idea how features evolve from one sign to another, and I am very, very, we are all fully aware of this, such that we have to consider using the word subtype and later on use the word phenotype, which I will discuss uh, later on. And during medical school and during our residency, we were taught that rosacea is more common in Caucasians, especially those with Celtic uh, descent. And this is definitely an erroneous uh, perception that it is rare or very uncommon in skin color. Well, basically, because in the past, or it was difficult to detect um, redness in Fitzpatrick skin types five and six. It's also it's very difficult also to detect erythema. Itching in rosacea is not a very high level symptom, 
And if we do dermoscopy to look for the network of blood vessels, most adults have the, have the laryngitis on the nose. And there's usually overlapping features of rosacea and acne among teenagers or uh, in younger patients. So how common is rosacea in pigmented skin, which was previously thought of as rare? Rosacea has been reported in countries whose populations have significant proportions of people with skin of color, so Africans, Asians, and uh, South Americans, as I think Indians as well, uh, with rates up to 10%. We more recently published US Medical Care Survey found that 3.9% of Rosacea patients were Latino, 2.2% were Asians and Pacific Islanders, and 2% were actually Blacks. However, if we have a very low index of suspicion and we cannot detect rosacea immediately and this diagnose as acne, this leads to a delayed diagnosis, more prolonged suffering of the patient, and definitely worsening of the disease. So I use this rosacea clinical scorecard in my everyday clinic. You can download it in the website of the National Rosacea Society. The scorecard is actually very useful. After patients disclose to us a history of flushing or flushing, in a more meticulous examination, we already observed climate exchanges. We look closely at the size of the nose, the chin, the labella, the, and the earlobes, and uh, the areas surrounding the eyes. And in this scorecard, we cannot immediately abandon the subtype, so it is still included in the scorecard. However, we intend to use the data later on for future uh, epidemiological research. So these are just examples of rosacea in brown skin among Filipinos. So when we use regular photography, we detect slight enlargement of the nose, but we cannot detect the redness. So this is eventually detected um, using a very sophisticated uh, medical imaging device with so a central facial uh, redness. And you see some acne, but if you don't see pomegranates, these are most likely the acne form reductions of uh, rosacea. This is persistent central facial redness in a um, Filipino, which slightly reduces with treatment, but it is very persistent. This is rhinophyma or enlargement of the nose and the pharophyma on the eyebrow area. This is rhinophyma in a patient. The actual volume of the nose decreases after treatment. There is also protrusion of the labella, which is a uh, Mentophyma, metophyma, and enlargement of the chin, which is called uh, natophyma. And this is rosacea in a medical student uh, who experiences uh, facial flushing. Um, there is already rhinophyma, there is central facial redness, and there is autophyma or enlargement of the in redness of the areas. So I reviewed all the cases of rosacea way back 20, 2010, 2010 when I had a discussion with one of the um, more senior dermatologists in the Philippines. So I have been using this scorecard for, um, for almost 10 years already. So these are the preliminary findings in the epidemiology and clinical features of Rosacea in uh, Filipinos. This is still unpublished. So I have a total of 58 cases. Most of them still follow up up to this time with uh, type 4 uh, skin phototype, 38 females. So it's also common among males. 13 to 70 years old with a mean age of 34. It was a descriptive cross-sectional study. So I did clinical evaluation and accomplishment of the NRS clinical scorecard. I did dermoscopy in all patients and took baseline info and follow up uh, 3D medical imaging uh, using a software and a camera for 20 years and tried to um, establish whether there is indeed an association with migraine, uh, gastrointestinal symptoms, or uh, ocular rosacea. So the more common primary features among Filipinos, I don't know if it's similar uh, in the Indian population, is flushing and then telangiectasia and then fixed central erythema and then the appearance of patterns in pustules. For the secondary features, the most common um, sign or symptom is burning or seeing sensation followed by dry appearance, uh, climate exchanges, uh, and so on and so forth. This is rosacea in the Filipino. Uh, this is rosacea in the Filipino family. This is the mother, and you will know um, multiple sebaceous hyperplasia in the nose of um, all three kids. Uh, they are all males: an 18-year-old male, 15, and 14. And we can already detect um, rhinophyma in these patients. They also develop 
um, acne or acne point eruption on the peri oral area, also on the chin. And if there are comedones, um, open and closed comedones on the forehead, so they, they, they might have um, both acne and uh, rosacea. So this is uh, fairly common in the Philippines. When I see a younger patient with rosacea, definitely one of the parents have uh, uh, display features of rosacea as well. And I examine whether the either the father or the mother has uh, rhinophyma. So this is the daughter and this is the father, which obviously has rhinophyma and uh, uh, natophyma. This is also a father and daughter rosacea. You can see the central facial redness. In the daughter, you see a network of blood vessels. There is redness on the chin, redness and swelling of the chin. And the father, who is a Filipino, has actually been diagnosed with rosacea and rhinophyma in the U.S. when he stayed there for a while. So now we go to the updated classification by the National Rosacea Society Expert Committee. So this was pre-published in 2017, but was eventually published in the JAD in uh, 2018. And this is authored by Dalio and colleagues who are all members of the National Rosacea Society Expert so this is the, um, the updated uh, classification. So it is divided into diagnostic phenotypes in which only one symptom or sign is required. Major phenotypes in which any two are required and secondary phenotypes. So for the major diagnostic phenotypes in which only one is required, we have one, uh, persistent central erythema or Phyma. And when we talk about phyma, or when we describe phyma, we have to examine our patients very well, whether they have enlargement of the nose, whether they have enlargement of the labella, the ear, the ear lobe, or the chin, as well as the um, periocular areas. For the major phenotypes, any two are required. So there should be um, a combination of either transplantation or edema plus something else, like inflammatory pathogens and Shows and what we commonly see in patriarchal rosacea, the presence of telangiectasia, um, which may be present on the nose but also on the cheeks, and then ocular features such as in ocular rosacea. And secondary phenotypes include burning, erythema, edema, and uh, blindness. So, this is the same criteria, this is just to reiterate uh, the present diagnostic features or diagnostic phenotypes of rosacea. So, we have to remember. That if you see a patient presenting with fixed central facial erythema and you're able to rule out all differential diagnoses, then most likely the patient has rosacea. Or if the patient presents with uh, phymatous changes and you have ruled out your differential diagnosis, then most likely your patient, you classify your patient as having rosacea already. For the major features, you need to have two. And for the secondary um, features, these are the signs and symptoms. For the treatment, these are the goals of treatment. And this is based on a fairly recent uh, published article by Alexis et al. entitled Global Epidemiology and Clinical Spectrum of Rosacea Highlighting Skin of Color. So, this is for us uh, Asians and Indians um, who display uh, like a brown uh, skin coloration, uh, color. So the goals of treatment is uh, to reduce papules and pustules, to promote clearance of lesions. In some cases, this might be temporary because the condition tends to be recurrent. We tend to avoid uh, confounding post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation of the eye, which this is fairly common uh, in among those Asia patients because they also use a lot of products in the past, which uh, has been irritating, which have been irritating. Long-term suppression of erythema and inflammation are usually desired by both clinicians and patients. But this is very difficult to handle, and sometimes in some patients, this might be uh, impossible. We, so we should be able to set realistic expectations for the timeline of treatment during the course of the disease. So this is a very practical uh, move. And it is important to educate uh, patients about the chronicity of the disease and its long-term uh, Management. So these are the more commonly used topical treatments uh, for rosacea. We have monidine, metronidazole, and acetic acid. I will discuss uh, ivermectin in one of the slides. Ivermectin is not available in most countries. So bimonidine um, is a very potent uh, smooth muscle vasoconstrictor. Uh, it causes decrease of the redness, however, it can cause severe transient rebound erythema. 9 to 12 hours after application. And what is the most common side effect? There's occurrence of persistent erythema 
in the skin adjacent to the site of long-term abdominal abdomination. Metronidazole has been in the market for some time. It's very effective uh, among patients. It's anti-inflammatory. It's also antimicrobial. It uh, inhibits the release of uh, the ROF, or the reactive oxygen uh, species from the neutrophils. Uh, it, re it reduces erythema. However, some of the side effects include local irritation, dryness, and uh, stain. Please take note of this slide. If you start the patient on metronidazole alone without systemic treatment, you will notice improvement two to four weeks um, out, after two to four weeks of care. And the full results are usually observed after eight to nine weeks of uh, treatment. Topical metronidazole as a maintenance therapy, you may probably ask yourselves uh, if you have used it before. Current studies suggest that maintenance therapy is more superior to sudden discontinuation or intermittent application of the, uh, of the pain. And this is just, this is the slide that I was talking uh, about. If you suspect that your patient has uh, concomitant um, hemodicosis or hemodex colliculitis on the background of causation, then you can also start your patient on a combination of metronidazole of one or 1% 1 ivermectin cream. If this is not available in your country and it's not received FDA approval, then you may probably ask your uh, pharmacy to compound uh, the pain. But this is, um, ivermectin is uh, widely used also in the US. Azimic acid, the third topical treatment, it's anti-inflammatory. It modulates the inflammatory response. It is antioxidative, like your metronidazole, and reduces erythema. The side effects include transient burning, uh, dryness, and uh, sting. Azimic acid is uh, reserved for papillopustular uh, rosacea. It reduces total inflammatory lesions in a double-blind uh, study. It's definitely better than the vehicle alone. And more favorable overall improvement is observed than the vehicle, the physician, and patient uh, ratings. So we now go to systemic therapy. I think you are interested to know that uh, your isotretinoin and your tetracyclines play a major role. So these are the dosages of the more, more famous um, tetracyclines and its derivatives you know, that we commonly use for rosacea as well as acne. So for tetracycline, 500 milligrams uh, twice daily for two to four weeks, for minocycline, 100 milligrams uh, once a day, two to four weeks. For doxycycline, 100 milligrams twice daily for two to three months, so it's more prolonged. Then decrease to 50 milligrams daily. However, in some countries, the 50 milligram uh, dose is not available. And then one of my favorites, especially during the pandemic, when there's flare up of either rosacea or acne um, due to the wearing of masks, which we call as mask. So 408 milligrams uh, once a day. In the Philippines, the preparation is 300 milligrams uh, once a day. But the duration of treatment should only be limited to two to three uh, weeks. This is the current recommendation from the Global Rosacea Con uh, Consensus 2019 panel or the uh, ROSCO. So, um, so this is just uh, basically a summary for, for mild rosacea, like we're dealing only with uh, redness, burning sensation, as a lake acid, if there's concomitant uh, demodex uh, infection, if you suspect demodex infection, then you can add ivermectin. Metronidazole is an excellent option in an oral doxycycline. For moderate rosacea, the treatment is almost the same. However, in severe uh, rosacea, then you can probably contemplate whether you can give uh, oral isotretinoid. Azithromycin is a, I consider it as a wonder drug, and it's now one of my favorite uh, antibiotics, not only for acne, but mostly for rosacea and for cases of. Uh, rosacea fulminans. And this has been suggested as a, a treatment for rosacea fulminans and for flares of rosacea during the rosacea uh, meeting at the World Congress of Dermatology in Milan by one of our most more, most senior uh, colleagues or experts on in rosacea. Azithromycin has been shown to be equally effective with doxycycline and in a Korean study of 67 patients Azithromycin 500 milligrams was given twice weekly on the first month. Please take note of the dosing and the schedule. 
Then 250 milligrams twice weekly on the second month and 250 milligrams twice, week, uh, twice weekly on the third month. Personally, I give azithromycin at 500 milligrams given twice weekly, so three consecutive days for a um, minimum of four weeks to a maximum of uh, six weeks. The efficacy is actually comparable to doxycycline 100 milligrams once a week for uh, three months. So we now go to isotretinoin. All of you, I think, are experts already on the mechanism of action of the drug. It's anti-inflammatory. It's the best treatment option for acne. Um, it causes atrophy of the pyrosebaceous unit. It can also be an antibacterial uh, by reducing the sebum production and altering uh, the, the, micro, the micro environment. However, there are some concerns about the um, uh, side effects, which we, I think we all, we all know. Oral isotretinoin is non-inferior to oral doxycycline in several studies uh, done and in a um, popular review. So you can either give your patients uh, doxycycline, and if you think that the patient is a perfect candidate for oral isotretinoin therapy, then um, this is actually, I think, is a better option. Um, this is a study uh, from our Indian colleagues. So mostly we have done studies on isotretinoin on acne and isotretinoin on, on rosacea. But this involves giving a low dose isotretinoin in mild to moderate papillo uh, rosacea. This is a retro study for review of 52 patients. In the Philippines, we also give isotretinoin at the low dose of um, 0 0.1 to 0 0.3. Uh, milligrams per kilogram per day. So this is uh, a retrospective review of patients who were started on 20 milligrams per day, then reduced to one to five times a week. So this was reduced to five milligrams per day for 57 weeks. And 91% of 42 over 46% of patients, the rosacea had cleared or was excellent. The side effect, as we all know, is a highlighted in half of the patients. So in the, for the conclusion of the study, very low dose isotretinoin, which involves giving 10 to 20 milligrams once or to five times a week, or equivalent to just five milligrams a day, is an effective treatment for mild to moderate active process and is very well tolerated. However, we all know that rebound or recurrence is very common in rosacea compared to uh, acne. So, Isoclodose isotretinoid is also effective when you want to um, treat like early rhinophyma. So at a, at a very low dose of 0.3 milligrams per kilogram, it is well tolerated and can be used for rosacea subtypes 2 and 3 with 24% remission. Low dose oral isotretinoid is slightly more effective. I think you will agree with you. It's definitely more effective than doxycycline in a high quality evidence in a population. For the skincare, this is um, just very short, but this is uh, this is from a very good publication in Skin of Color. So these are the recommended skincare in your patients. So definitely, we give our rosacea patients very mild uh, skincare uh, regimen. So um, we we should prescribe a gentle, non-alkaline, fragrance-free, do more than cancer once a day in the evening. Silicon-based moisturizers, those moisturizers which contain dimethicone, which is anti, um, which is anti which is not comedogen, and mild. Light water-based cosmetics and physical sunscreens such as titanium dioxide and zinc oxide are also recommended. Um, the practice in the past in the Philippines, we used to give or prescribe a lot of alcohol-based sensors and astringents and abrasive escalating sensors. This should all be avoided in uh, rosacea. And the use of non silicone based moisturizers, cosmetics with very iridescent effects, um, which blocks the pores also, and chemical sunscreens are not uh, recommended in these patients. So these are just before and after photos of patients who I treated. This, this patient presented, she's 28 years old, presented with papular rosacea only on the Chin and there is already swelling and enlargement. So I gave the patient a in 500 milligrams three times a week for four to six weeks. Isotretinoin 10 milligrams uh, OD for six weeks. 
on her third week of acetromycin and just topical metronidazole, and we see the improvement. So this was uh, after four months uh, of uh, treatment. So there is resolution of the papillomal sugar lesions, and until now, I maintain the patient on very low dose isotretinoin, so just uh, two capsules in a week and topical metronidazole. However, if you highlight the centrifugal redness, this is still very obvious at baseline, and even after the, the patient does not uh, demonstrate symptoms of rosacea anymore. So this is also before and after photos. So this is uh, thick centrifugal erythema, which, is, which has been corrected by um, oral low-dose isotretinoin and topical metronidazole. I have managed to uh, use the new generation 577 nanometer vascular laser in this patient, and she underwent, um, she had four sessions. So for um, apneiform eruptions, uh, which we previously called as um, apne, sometimes we, we label these patients as having adult onset apne, but we will already know the right of phyma and the enlargement of the chin and the blood vessels. So I gave the patient the following treatment with the market improvement, similar case. This is uh, a classic patient with rosacea. So again, I gave the patient azithromycin for the redness and for the acne or acne from eruptions. And then I gave the patient isotretinoin uh, during the third week of azithromycin treatment and then topical metronidazole. I managed to uh, use the 577 nanometer laser on this patient for uh, Two sessions, and this is a um, 32 year old male who always thought that uh, his acne would be non stop. The patient did not have acne, the patient actually has rosacea, there is already prominent rhinophyma and lentophyma and enlargement of the uh, labella. And non stop, what we call nodular cystic acne, is actually a form of popular postular rosacea. So I gave the patient the same treatment. Acetromycin for the inflammatory lesions, isocretinoin, low dose isocretinoin for long term um, use, sometimes for six to eight months, and then just uh, topical metronidazole, uh, 0.75%. And lastly, I would like to acknowledge my colleagues and some of my Durham residents, and of course, my um, idol, Professor Jaya Kar Thomas, for the uh, opportunity. So thank you very much you know, for. Your time. Thank you, sir. Uh, I would like to invite uh, Dr. Uday Preet Sidhu as well as Dr. Danalakshmi Ma to uh, take up the questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Joannis, for a very interesting and a precise um, talk. You took us through the clinical sco uh, score, the classification, the clinical features, and also the treatment in the various clinical settings. And uh, <clears throat> I do have a question here from our wonderful audience. And they want to know, what is the role of medical management in rhinophyma? Well, the role of medical management in, for the, the role of medical management in uh, rhinophyma I usually uh, examine my younger uh, patients, for example, those in their teenage years, if I already detect that there is multiple sebaceous hyperplasia, there's nonstop appearance of papules and pustules on the nose, then most likely these patients, this subset of patients may develop a more severe form of rhinophyma later on. And I have to explain to the, to the patients as well as their uh, parents that we have to start on medical management. And I have seen a couple of cases who were treated with oral isotretinol in the past during the start of my practice, which is about 10 to 15 years ago. And when I see them today, when they follow up with me, the rhinophyma is not uh, very obvious anymore. I think early medical intervention for rhinophyma is necessary to prevent future um, 
enlargement of the nose. Because if we take rhinopharma for granted, if the patient develops fibrosis already, and this is proven by biopsy. So if the patient reaches the age of like 30, 40, or 50, and they come to us with rhinopharma already, I tell them, I usually advise them that medical management will not be effective um, anymore. So we have to start early, and I think as dermatologists, we have to screen the early signs of uh, rhinophyma among our uh, patients. Okay, thank you, sir. That question was from Dana Lakshmi, ma'am. And uh, <clears throat> ma'am is also here with us today, which is very nice. I also have a quick question. Um, I would want to understand that, um, you know, the erythematous and um, the telangiectatic component of rosacea is something which um, is quite challenging um, mm -hmm. to treat. Mm -hmm. So how do you proceed? What would be your thoughts or guidelines about it? Okay, so for the erythema, um, I should be honest. I mean, in, in, um, in the way I manage my uh, patients, when I detect that the erythema is quite resistant to topical medications, for example, metronidazole, then my second line would be oral uh, medication. And rather than give long-term antibiotics, for example, doxycycline, I usually prescribe isotretinoin, similar to the way uh, we prescribe uh, isotretinoin for acne. I noticed that this um, controls, especially if the uh, if the centrofacial redness um, is quite embarrassing uh, to the patients. Yeah? Uh, I noticed that it can control the redness as well as it can control the, the progression or the development of uh, telangiectasia or some blood vessels. However, we should never forget that we should advise our patients proper skin care if we don't want the erythema or the um, telangiectasia to worsen. If we advise our patients to limit exposure to direct, for example, uh, sunlight, and to stop using uh, products, skincare products with very harsh ingredients, I think um, they will be able to um, age in a very, even if they have rosacea, in a um, very nice way that they don't develop uh, uh, more severe redness or very prominent in on the on the cheeks because you know in the in the Philippines I don't know if it is also the same in uh, India some of our products contain um, very harsh uh, very harsh ingredients some some of the products also contain steroids especially the whitening products that are available um, like online so. It's basically advising our patient constantly on what to use. And if we detect, like for example, uh, or if we can predict a permanent sequelae like rhinophyma or uh, scarring from rosacea fulminans, then we should institute medical management at once. Right, right, right. Uh, <clears throat> yes, um, I think every place has its own challenges. and. Yeah. Uh, uh, <clears throat> Professor Jekyll, sir, is there um, something uh, you would want to add on to, sir? <clears throat> okay, I think sir is on a call. And uh, we'll uh, take another question, um, Dr. Joannes, for you. Uh, and um, the um, question is, what are your views on treatment with trinexamic acid for melasma? It's a little different from the topic, but... It's come, so I thought I'd pose it to you. Yeah, but it's also good that we um, bring up uh, melasma uh, in the in the in the the topic of melasma in the Q and A because I noticed that patients who have melasma and have been using products, skin lightening products, with very strong ingredients, and if they have a concomitant rosacea, both the rosacea and the melasma worsens, and as we all know. Sometimes uh, those patients with rosacea develop a more severe form of uh, post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation because first and foremost, the skin is already um, inflamed. But say for Professor Dr. Lashmi. Yes, sir. You got something to ask? Yes, yeah, sir. I have one question, sir. Let him finish yes. this. 
the safer products for uh, melasma is um, azelaic acid or the uh, derivative called um, azelaic. Phenixamic acid, I think it's harmless. Any skin lightening product, which is uh, irritating, especially those which can, uh, and some anti aging products. So I just read from an article some products which contain like tretinoin 0.5% or 0.1%. Uh, percent may be very irritating in rosacea patients. So it is not recommended as an anti-aging or a skin lightening regimen. Right, right, right. Uh, Dana Lakshmi, ma'am? Yes, please. Uh, sir, uh, Dr. Janus, I have a question. Yes, ma'am. Uh, is it possible by starting the isotroin very early, is there any chance of preventing rhinophyma? I, I think so, ma'am. I've seen uh, patients who started with isotretinoin quite early. And uh, you notice that in the recent um, recent edition of Fitzpatrick, uh, multiple sebaceous hyperplasia on the nose is already considered as pre or uh, as pre rhinophyma. So it can herald to a more severe form of rhinophyma later on. And I think if we can control the sebaceous hyperplasia by medical management with isotretinoin, then the patient will not have a very enlarged nose later on. So it is worth starting in early cases, uh, yes, moderate. Yes. Uh, I have actually. seen cases from 10 to 15, 15 years ago, and I still get to see them again. And I don't see the rhinophyma which is present in their parents. They're not the same. Like uh, acne scars, we are see on the patient's uh, parents' face. Same yes. way we can see same their way. parents. Yeah, yes. very similar. Yeah. Yes. Professor oh, Jacobson. Professor Johannes Neri. Yes, we keep meeting offline so frequently. Of course, we also meet in person in India, outside India, in Canada, uh, in Italy, all yeah. over. <laughs> now, my I point is a little bit, you know, I thought you were mentioning about Mervaso. Ramonidin. Ramonidin. Mervaso. It is an alpha agonist. It's an alpha agonist. Have you tried it? Uh, Johannes? It was available in the, my boss was available in the Philippine market um, like maybe 10 years ago. If I may suggest. 10 years ago, but they withdrew it from the market because the uh, uh, effect is only temporary. So it's basically used for cosmetic purposes already. Or only. If I may suggest, there is another alpha agonist which is very, very economical. The oxymetazolin, which is used as nasal drops. Yeah. Oh. Uh, even spray, it's available as. That can be used just to touch over the lesions, you know. And I see that we get good response with it. Oh, very nice. Anything that's fairly cheap in the, in the drug Because store. that is also an alpha agonist. Oh, okay. The same. audio is muted. If we are waiting Sorry. for the next speaker, huh? Uh, can we take one more uh, question, sir? Yes, yes, yes. Uh, wonderful. So, uh, <clears throat> so this uh, question is, um, uh, so the audience do want to know that how to manage drug toxicity in cases of long-term treatment? Um, I think the, the the doctor is referring to uh, long-term use of isopetroin, is that correct? Yeah. Yes. I think in Likely. the Philippines as well as in India, we 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 started prescribing isopetroin as very low dose already compared to the compared to, for example, US and Europe where they follow guidelines. And our prescription of low dose isopretinoin is basically if it is based on the experience of our more senior colleagues. So, in the patients that I'm handling, if I'm giving low dose isopretinoin for um, six to eight months, uh, I don't see, I don't usually see any uh, side effects. There are recent recommendations from the AED, uh, they, they uh, are suggesting some guidelines to. Uh, simply to prevent uh, the onset of uh, complications. For example, monitoring the lipid profile 
and the um, liver enzymes at baseline and only after two months. If the results are normal, then you don't have to repeat the lab tests again. Our only concern is about pregnancy. And I think this is very well stressed. Uh, I mean, this is very uh, much highlighted when we explain to our uh, female patients. But I don't usually prescribe uh, isotretinoin in, in patients who are uh, planning to have children. Yes, and in I, their I, childbearing age. Yeah, so I think now, because isocretinone has been in the market for quite some time, both Filipino and Indian dermatologists, we can already detect whether the patient will have complications or not. I'm also uh, very particular about giving isocretinone among obese um, teenagers because sometimes, the, because sometimes the lipid profile and the liver enzymes are quite elevated. So I don't usually start giving the capsule without the blood test, but most of them have higher um, values. That's that's quite an insightful thing, and uh, it's been a pleasure, Dr. Duranis, to have you here. And, uh, yeah, my pleasure, too. Thank, thank you, you so much. I would hand over the stage to Dr. Padan. Thank you, sir. Thank you, ma'am. We move on to the next session, the last lecture of today. Uh, I would like to invite Professor Najib Doss. So. JT, sir, you wanted to speak? Yes. Good afternoon from Chennai, India, Professor Das. Can you hear me? Have you unmuted yourself, please? Please unmute yourself. Somebody could do it from, from Doc Plexus. You hear me? Yes. Okay. Thank you very much for being with us. My pleasure. Thank you very much for honoring our invitation. My pleasure, so my pleasure, sir. Yeah. So. And uh, for those who have not met Dr. Professor Das, of course, I have not met him in person, but I keep meeting him on the RX dam frequently. So Professor Najib Das, the professor of dermatology in Tunisia, one of the board, one of the directors, the board of directors of the International Society of Dermatology, served as vice president of the International Society of Dermatology for four long years, 2017 to 2021. He was the vice president of the Tunisian Society of Dermatology for six years, 2007 to 2013. Secretary General of the Pan Arab League of dermatologists, 2000 to 2004. His main interests, fields of interest include psoriasis, particularly nail diseases and skin infections. Yes. Professor Das is with us today to talk on 50 shades of psoriasis. 50 shades of psoriasis. Just I'm looking for my presentation, how to do, how to do. You have to share your screen, Professor Das, first. Yes. And the stage is all yours. Ah. Kindly adjust your camera so that your whole face is seen. Aha. Uh -huh. Do you see that? Not yet, sir. We don't see Not yet. Screen. Is 
Yes. Yes, yes. Thank you. It's okay. So 50 shades of uh, psoriasis, as you know, psoriasis is a chronic systemic inflammatory skin disease manifests itself on many parts of the skin. So different clinical presentation of or shades could be seen in different situations, such as when mimicking or in association with other diseases. So I would like to share with you some cases, some clinical uh, diagnosis, where the clinical diagnosis is not so obvious because of the different shades of the disease, maybe less than 50, but we should be aware of that. The first case, this boy was referred for erythematous KD plaque on the elbow and knees with a specific distribution on the face. It start four years ago and partially improved in summer. As we see, we have a combination of clinical features of eczema, dermatitis, and psoriasis. In fact, psoriasis in children may be confused clinically with atopic dermatitis, and indeed, the two conditions may coexist. To distinguish this disease when there is no overlap is critical for correct and time diagnosis and optimal treatment. The second case, a 45 years old man referred to us for itchy, erythematous scaly lesion on the hands, feet, knees, elbows, which started three months ago, patient was known to have some flares of eczema. Antihistaminic and topical corticosteroid use did not improve, obviously, the condition. Two biopsies were performed and two different results were received. Is two pathological features of psoriasis in one and feature of sporogenic dermatosis in the second. We didn't perform patch tests as the flare didn't calm down. The question was, was that psoriasis, eczema, or coexistent psoriasis and eczema or allergic contact dermatitis in sensitized psoriasis? Our question is still open and unanswered, but our patient was improved with methotrexate. It, uh, this is a 20 years old girl seen with psoriasis papillus squamous, sharply defined lesion are distributed on the face, neck, trunk, with slight delicate slate. There was neither atrophy nor hypopigmentation. Hyperkeratotic lesion are on the sole and palms. The eruption did not occur after solar exposure, and the disease started two months earlier. Laboratory examination is to pathology on the scalp, psoriasis, on the face, lupus. Direct immunofluorescence negative, ANI negative, no other symptom. So, one should raise a question was that psoriasis? Lupus, subcutaneous lupus erythematosus, or coexistent psoriasis and lupus. It was almost the latter condition as it has been reported and it represents a therapeutic challenge. Medication commonly used for lupus are known to make psoriasis worse. Likewise, UV phototherapy used for many patients with cutaneous psoriasis is generally avoided in lupus because of risk of photosensitivity. Also, TNF-alpha inhibitors are a well-established therapy for psoriasis. They often are avoided in lupus. Psoriasis and vitiligo. 
Psoriasis so, and vitiligo are common dermatologic condition with underlying autoimmune etiologies. There are few reports of concomitant and co-localized disease, but no proper relationship has been found between these two diseases. Several theories have been proposed to explain this right presentation, but it seems that the two diseases would have a common ground, which is a low level of vitamin D. That's why some treatment, such as narrow band UVB, is efficient in psoriasis and in some cases of vitiligo. Inverse psoriasis is a rare form of psoriasis that affects between 3 to 7 percent of psoriasis patients, especially in elderly. It appearance and distribution in the flexural skin force make a difficult disease to diagnose. It is often confused with tinea curves. Psoriasis and seborrheic dermatitis are both chronic erythematoscale dermatoses that can involve the skull and the face. It may be difficult to differentiate these two diseases when there is isolated scalp involvement. Dermoscopy seems to be valuable for clinical diagnosis and differential diagnosis of scalp psoriasis and seborrheic dermatitis. So, on this photo, the student look so similar and so maybe related. In fact, they are not, and they have not the same family name either as this similar lesion. This boy with scaly patches on the scalp with normal hair, this feature fit with the diagnosis of psoriasis. But if we look on the side of the scalp, there is a patch without hair. It was tinea. So he had psoriasis and tinea. Two different patients with thick scales on the elbows and the sacral area. It was crusted scabies and psoriasis on the right slide. Two other patients with scales on the elbows. It was psoriasis and scabies. Nay, psoriasis and onychomycosis widely reported and often confused you know, psoriasis and onychomycosis. Erythematous scaly lesion on the elbows in three different patients. Almost similar lesion. It was eczema, it was Leishmania, psoriasis, and Leishmania. Erythematous with slight delicate scaling on the elbows. It was tinea and psoriasis. So I am focusing on the elbows with this similar relation was eczema, psoriasis, and eczema. Erythema with scales on the left photo, it was tinea and psoriasis. For plantar keratoderma, it was palmoplantar keratoderma and psoriasis. Here we have a yellow and thick keratoderma of the soles. It was palmoplantar keratoderma, it was psoriasis and palmoplantar keratoderma, the melida, with a thick scale of the heel. Here it was frictional keratoderma and psoriasis. Psoriasis often misdiagnosed as STI, 
In fact, it was psoriasis and scabies. And as a conclusion, I would like to say that many mistakes are made by not looking than by not knowing. And thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you, sir. It was a wonderful presented indeed. Uh, um, the floor is open for discussion. Dr. Danleshmi, please take over. So the combination of tinea uh, capitis and uh, psoriasis scalp. Yeah. Uh, uh, how it was managed, sir? How to manage? First of all, yes. we treat the tinea. It's easy okay. to treat it. Okay. Of course, it is. And then we do we we treat uh, the, uh, the psoriasis. But we okay. start by treating tinea tinea capitis. Yes. Otherwise, the topical steroids can promote uh, tinea capitis in the cognito. Yes. Of course. The palmoplantar keratoderma and also psoriasis. Uh, is it coexistence of psoriasis and palmoplantar keratoderma? Are two different patients manifesting similarly like that, sir? I didn't Palmo this palmoplantar keratoderma yeah, and yeah, yeah. psoriasis. You know, you know, uh, there is a study done by uh, Professor Dumertre, yeah. which concluded to six phototype of psoriasis. One of the phototype was palmoplantar keratoderma. It is a clinical form which is very common in our area. And really, it is um, a challenging problem because for the diagnosis first and second for the management. Uh, management is very, very, very difficult and um, we don't know exactly what to do. And on souls, um, you know that biologic children are not so level in Asia. Differentiating skin lesions are this. Sir, this is the uh, psoriasis and uh, skin lesion in diabetes. In diabetes? Yes. Maybe they are meaning about uh, some uh, psoriasis, penile region, and paranopastitis. I'm not exact. The audience question. I mean psoriasis and diabetes? Yes. Ah, you know, diet in our area the is around 20%. It's very high. So, uh, we have many specific lesions, diabetes, okay. I mean skin lesion, but the uh, the diabetes is well known as a comorbidity for psoriasis, and we have to manage diabetes, diabetes when managing psoriasis, which is also very difficult in our area. And um, what I can say that uh, we see a lot of psoriasis and diabetes. Well said, sir. It's a very difficult yeah. situation when both comes together. Yes. Um, you know, in, in, uh, in psoriasis and, uh, and diamond, we have a lot of questions about especially onychodystrophy, 
was it psoriasis or onychomycosis in diabetes? Yes. And uh, we launched a study about uh, onychodystrophy, onychodystrophy in diabetes patients. 40% uh, of them were, were was onychomycosis. So it is for all considerations. First, we have to treat as onychomycosis. Oh, we have to treat. Than, I don't know. Yes. Sorry, as is onychomycosis. Maybe so we in call. diabetes. Yes. Yeah. I hope next time we will be in India or in Tunis. You are most welcome. To Tunis. Thank you, sir, for the kind uh, invitation. <laughs> and um, just um, I think this opportunity to announce that uh, SPIN meeting will be held in the Paris in 2022 in July. 2022. July in Paris. That's nice. I think the first week of July. Uh, it is a very nice meeting in very nice city uh, by a very nice weather also in July in Paris and hope and uh, looking forward to meeting all of you in Paris inshallah next year. Thank you sir, it's nice to hear from you. <laughs> <laughs> So you have to unmute yourself, JT sir. So please okay. unmute yourself. Dr. Uday, any more questions from audience? Uh, no, ma'am, we don't have any questions at the moment. I think Jacker sir is muted. JT sir? Yeah. Yes. We have no more questions and no more discussions. We thank Professor Das for being with us, Johannes for being with us to the end, and of course, Madam Vinu has also been with us from the morning. Thank you very much, Madam, all our friends. And uh, but that's not my duty. The vote of thanks uh, duty is to Padam, Dr. Padam. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. So, good evening, everybody. On behalf of Indian Society of Teledermatology, I would like to be happy to announce the vote of thanks. So, all that begins well, ends well. I would like to thank the Almighty for the successful event today uh, with more than 800 viewers. So, first, I would like to propose my thanks to my teacher, mm -hmm. my mentor, uh, President of Indian Society of Teledermatology, Professor Jaikar Thomas, sir, for guiding me throughout for conducting this successful event today. I would like to thank uh, Professor Parimalam Kumar and Professor Dr. U. R. Dhanalakshmi, Madam, uh, Vice Presidents, for guiding us. Uh, I next thank uh, Professor uh, Dr. Dinesh Kumar, a uh, past General Secretary, for being by uh, my side and guiding us throughout. I like to thank uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Uday Kumar. Uh, Uday Pate Sidhu for uh, helping us throughout the day. So I next thank uh, our speakers, our eminent speakers, international speakers, Professor Robert Schwartz, Professor Bing Theo, Professor George Prince, Professor Najib Doss, Prof. Dr. Janus Dyrit, and our national speakers, Dr. Rajiv Shekhari and Minu Shekhari, Dr. Uday Pate Sidhu for uh, readily accept accepting our invitation to be the part of faculty and uh, conducting the event in a successful manner. I would also thank uh, Dr. Annie Clay, project manager of SPIN, uh, for uh, assisting us to rope in a uh, few of our speakers. Next, I would like to thank our digital partner, Texas, particularly Dr. Priyanka Pawar and Dr. Madhu Chaudhary, also Mr. Nathan and the entire Doc Texas team for all your support. I next thank our academic partner, uh, Mrs. Sebamad, in particular, Mr. Prashant, for being uh, the uh, sponsor of the event. Last, I thank our audience uh, for joining us today and 
in uh, and actively participating in the event before we sign out uh, i would like to extend my invitation to join indian society of tele dermatology to all our audience you can write us the email or uh, visit our website and uh, sign in from there those who have missed the event uh, can see the event later at the youtube link uh, given below so once again thank you all for being a part of today's event and uh, good evening Thank you.